For nearly five years, we've heard the story of Luis Elizondo. After retiring as a senior intelligence officer within the Department of Defense, and after being a former counterintelligence agent within the U.S. Army, his efforts and his story have played a crucial role in the change in global conversation about UFOs and UAP. His actions and his story may have even played a role in motivating Congress to create legislation and pursue answers to a pressing mystery. But according to Elizondo, his actions didn't come without a cost. According to him, he was faced with retribution, false information to the public, abuse by government authority, and the illegal destruction of information, all by people within the very department he once worked for. So to clear his name, he filed a 64-page complaint to the Department of Defense Office of the Inspector General. This video is a deep dive into that very document, as published in redacted form by the New York Post. What's in it? What exactly is being alleged? And does the evidence that we can get access to support or contradict the rather pointed allegations about certain individuals? Stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the black vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., owner, founder, creator of TheBlackVault.com, and today we're doing a show that has been heavily requested. And I will warn you right now, I have no idea how long it's going to end up. Obviously, you will be able to see this now uh, lengthwise in the description. And if you're watching on YouTube or your podcast uh, streaming, you'll be able to see the length of it. But as of right now, I have no idea where we're going to end up, but likely a couple of hours. This is a deep dive into the Luis Elizondo IG complaint. Now, a lot of you have seen this. It was released by the New York Post uh, um, not too long ago, but it's been long enough to where some of you may have even forgotten about it. But also some of you may not know what I'm talking about. And what we're going to do is dive into the complaint that finally came out into the public realm that explains Luis Elizondo's essentially complaint, but his his gripe, if you will, with the Department of Defense and certain people within. Now, I'm not here to tell you who's guilty, who's not, who should be fired or, or anything like that. that. That's not what I'm going to do with this video. But rather, I will go through this complaint page by page. And yes, we will read it together. I understand this video may not be for everybody. So if you're cringing at the fact that we're going to read something together, uh, no worries. You don't have to go ahead and, and sit through this. But know that I'm not going to sit here and read word for word. Rather, I will read the complaint word for word. But in addition to giving additional information, additional context, and posing questions that I think need to be asked and ultimately answered, but I have no idea if they ever will. So I want to just dive into this and likely I'll make a mistake here or there. I'll try and edit out the, 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 the big ones, but rather there's a lot of slides to go through in this deck. There's a lot of pages of the complaint, some of which we can go through rather quickly. Others take a little bit more time. As you can imagine, I've created a slide deck for you guys, which is going to break down the entire complaint page by page, and then again, in addition to other information. But I also want to point out that this has been rearranged a little bit when it comes to the page. At first, I wanted to just have you guys download from the New York Post's Drop Dropbox account, and that way you could follow along. It didn't work out great because uh, in Luis Elizondo's complaint, he references a bunch of attachments. And in the copy that came out to the general public, they were not numbered as they were in his letter and in his outline of his complaint. So to match them up took a little bit more 
uh, work than just going, oh, attachment four, okay, let's go to attachment four. They weren't numbered that way. And in my opinion, weren't uh, in that order without numbers. So it's not like you could just go and figure it out. Rather, they were a little bit jumbled. The emails also were in different chronological order. There was also a repeated page in the copy that I downloaded anyway. So I took that out, but rearranged the emails in chronological order. That way it makes more sense. So that's the difference. But if you haven't seen the IG complaint, look in the description below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're streaming the podcast, just know it is in the show notes version as well. So you can go to the New York Post's YouTube account and the video that Stephen Greenstreet did on the basement office breaking down quite a few things about Luis Elizondo's story, but the complaint popped up shortly after that video first aired and they, uh, meaning the New York Post released it. So kudos to them. I want to start there for taking a very important document and putting it out there. I did try and get this in two different ways and failed in both attempts. Once uh, with Luis Elizondo, that failed. That did not work. He didn't. I, I'm. It was private communication, so I'm not going to say anything other than uh, they said no. They meaning Luis Elizondo, and he obviously works with some PR people. The second way I tried to get it was through the Freedom of Information Act. He submitted it to the Department of Defense Office of the Inspector General, filing his complaint against certain people. We'll go over those people in a moment. Uh, I tried through FOIA. It was also denied that uh, the FOIA process exempts something like this uh, for a couple different reasons, which uh, I won't go into, but rather it's just exempted and I was unable to get it. Whether or not there will be a final report, whether or not that they were even doing an investigation, whether or not they're even doing an evaluation on this specific complaint has not been confirmed. I know Luis Elizondo is, and his attorney, Daniel Sheehan, in podcasts and so on, have said quite a bit about this whole thing, and it could very well be true. All I am saying and adding here is that the DOD IG, the Office of the Inspector General, will not comment. And I tried as recent as in the last week of the airing, the first airing of this video. So in the last week, I tried to get the DOD IG to say, hey, yes, we're doing an investigation. Hey, we're not doing an investigation. Hey, we're doing an eval, something, and they will not do it. So I tried again. I did hear back. So that was not a, a uh, ignoring of the request. They did respond, but it is their policy not to comment on any type of complaint like this or what the outcome would be. That being said, let's go ahead and jump into it. Now, let me get my laser pointer here because I'm always point around here if you're watching the visuals. I'm just going to start from the top. This is the first page, the, the, the top of the PDF. This obviously is the what they call the DOD hotline, how Mr. Elizondo filed his complaint and all of the information that he filled out. You can see here under part one, your information. He um, had checked, I choose to identify myself for the complaint, meaning he wasn't going to be anonymous. And the second thing he checked, I give permission for DOD hotline to release my identity outside the DOD hotline on a need to know basis. All right. So he wasn't afraid to make the complaint and be named in the process. Uh, not checked was I don't give permission, meaning a anonymous complaint. Going through these pages, you can see Mr. Luis Daniel Elizondo. Uh, this is something that I want to point out that I don't believe has been addressed. Now, I know that he's come out since, I believe, in podcasts and said that he was a government contractor. Uh, however, the employee status, you would think that from the DOD, he would be a retiree or a contractor employee. You can see those two options here. When he filed this, I don't believe it was public knowledge. I did not try and figure out that timeline because it's irrelevant. But regardless, for quite some time, we just thought he was a retiree. He talked about living in a trailer in Southern California for quite some time and then moved to another state. It came out later that he was working as a government contractor and maintained his uh, security clearance. So... Whichever one is right, neither one was checked. You can see here he checked other. So I'm not entirely sure why he would do that, what that means. Uh, but you can see here assigned DOD branch, Department of Defense. 
This was filed after he retired. So if he was a contractor employee, meaning working for a government contractor, he technically would be a contractor working for somebody else and technically not a DOD employer, or excuse me, employee, because the DOD is not his employer. It may seem like I'm playing a little bit of like nitpicking here, but it's important at this level that if he's going to be submitting complaints about people and talking about himself, uh, we, I think, can nitpick. So if he was that contractor, why isn't it checked? But it says other Department of Defense. Now there's a lot of rumor about him working for, I've seen Space Force and I've seen Space Command. And yes, I do believe those would be two technically different things. I've seen statements that he's working for uh, both, meaning somebody messed up. I doubt he's working for all of them. So maybe that plays a role in this. But regardless, something that I wanted to point out there uh, that kind of stuck out as odd. Going through the pages, uh, these redactions, I want to point out, are likely done by the New York Post when they released this. However, I do not know what in the original um, version, let's say, to the DOD, if anything, likely this was not redacted. Uh, but later on, if anything was redacted, I, I, I don't know what the DOD IG got. Uh, but rather, what I'm showing you is what the New York Post got and released and that's what we're looking at. So I think it's safe to assume these redactions are for privacy reasons, as done by the New York Post. So those are all personally identifying information. Uh, you can see here he was willing to be interviewed. And here's where we're going to start breaking down the people. These are the allegations that Luis Elizondo is making and who he is making them to. First up on the list on the form, Gary Reed. Now, if you don't know who Gary Reed is, he might ring a bell. You can see here is a retiree. I don't believe that was accurate either. Uh, a civilian employee likely was accurate. Uh, worked for the USD um, or Office of the Other Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, now named and Security. And Gary Reed is the guy that you likely heard about. As I hate to use the word, but essentially kind of a scumbag, uh, was accused of multiple inappropriate relationships inside the Pentagon. You can see here in April of 2002, Brian Bender from Politico outlined the fact that, uh, and I'll quote here, top Intel official had inappropriate relationship, misused email, Pentagon probe found. Gary Reed still oversaw a series of sensitive portfolios after the 2020 investigation concluded he violated policy. This here is Gary Reed in all his glory. Now, I don't want to be accusatory of the guy. I don't know him. I've never talked to him. Don't care to. I read enough in the complaint that he kind of sounds like a sleazebag. Uh, so sorry, that just kind of is what it is. And he was found in violation of certain things. They could not substantiate other things and was uh, uh, eventually moved. We'll get to that in a moment. But I want to stick with Gary Reed for a minute because this is kind of the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this complaint and the overall narrative around Luis Elizondo and the problems that he's had and the, the opposition that he's had that essentially here we are setting up good guys and bad guys. And Gary Reed has obviously become a bad guy and it very well could be warranted. But this will make a little bit more sense as we go through here because you'll see certain names being set up as essentially those bad guys. And the question mark really has to become, are they really, are they truly the root of this problem? And have they targeted Mr. Elizondo and will they be found uh, essentially liable, guilty, whatever the, the wording will be in a complaint like this, but um, will they be found to be in violation of policy or so on and so forth? But what's weird about the Gary Reed story is how awful the reporting really was. Now, again, I want to repeat this a million times. I'm not defending the guy. The guy likely is, you know, scummy uh, from what I've read. But if that's true, it should be pretty easy to craft a narrative about the guy who's being ousted from the Department of Defense, because that's essentially the story that we got from the debrief. Now, this is credit to the original person that that broke the story. Uh, so the debrief was the one that uh, that that did break this. Tim McMillan was the author. Sex, lies and UFOs, Pentagon's head of counterintelligence 
and security ousted. That was April 14th, 2022. Now, essentially, everybody who read this article, the majority of people that read it, uh, essentially walked away that he was fired. Even Tim McMillan used the word fired in one of his tweets. So I, I'm pretty confident that that's what they were trying to convey with the article, that he was just gone. But there was a, a, a couple of people that started making some phone calls, one of which I know Jazz Shaw was, was tweeting out. Uh, he is a journalist with uh, the online publication Hot Air. Um, myself had heard the same thing that Gary Reed was actually still showing up to work and then what he wasn't ousted. So what was odd was there was this whole narrative that was crafted about this guy being fired and he was still showing up at the Pentagon. So I was pushing for official statements to confirm that jazz was pushing uh, through through, uh, you know, his his means to get official statements. He was also tweeting about this and getting a lot of heat for it because everybody said, well, the scumbags fired. Why is anybody you know, challenging this, but it turned out to not be true that he was still showing up. So then the story shifted a little bit. I think that the phrasing that was used was that he was floating a desk. So he was still there, but he didn't have any duties. Okay. Um, well, that part didn't make sense, but who knows? Maybe that was true. But then the Daily Mail jumped in on it and uh, they had a quote unquote exclusive sex spats and UFOs. Top Pentagon Intel official under investigation for having an affair with staffer and interfering with secret aerospace program is dismissed and replaced with his mistress. So one of the people that he was accused of having this inappropriate relationship with, which they've now labeled his mistress, was taking his spot. The problem was is that that wasn't true either. There was no evidence to support that whatsoever. Um, but here is uh, one of the tweets that went out. This is the Tim McMillan tweet that I had uh, referenced to you using the word fired. There were some anonymous officials who gave their opinion as to why Reed was fired. However, it was repeatedly made abundantly clear by me, them, God, and country that the official explanation was has not been made public, so it's unknown. This was in a longer thread uh, explaining essentially some people kind of throwing some questions his way of some of the facts not lining up. But you can see that the word uh, fired was being used. Um, so eventually, right, the Daily Mail comes out and they said what they did. Uh, Tim McMillan saying he's fired. Then it kind of changed to floating his desk. So there was all sorts of things that were that were not correct. Well, on April 24th of, of this year, I got uh, and so did many others who were pushing for answers. John Kirby, who's the Pentagon press secretary, was at the time. He stated, we can confirm that Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Secretary Ron Moultrie has directed the reassignment of Mr. Gary Reed to the Defense Intelligence Agency. It should be noted the DIA is an arm of the DOD. So if you're fired from the DOD, especially if you're slummy and sleazy, my guess is they're not going to move you to some other office within the DOD. You're gone. It's like working for a major corporation and somebody accuses you of sexual harassment and essentially you're found to be that slummy guy, chances are you probably won't just get a promotion or move somewhere else in the same company, you're going to be gone. So it was just weird, right? I mean, the, like the whole story was was just weird. In fact, it got weirder in the Daily Mail because Luis, Luis Elizondo then began to make direct accusations and connecting the ousting of Gary Reed. So regardless of him, you know, being fired or transferred to the DIA, it was Elizondo who decided to take credit for that ousting. Some of the quotes from the Daily Mail, quote, he claims that Reed was under investigation for his treatment of Elizondo, as well as alleged sexual harassment of one of Elizondo's subordinates and several other sexual misconduct claims. Uh, he again, meaning Elizondo. Lou Elizondo, a former senior staffer, claims in an exclusive interview with DailyMail.com and the counterintelligence, uh, excuse me, that the counterintelligence chief is in the process of being dismissed for a spat over UFOs and that his replacement is his alleged mistress. So obviously Elizondo is the one that floated the mistress, was taking a hold of the position. Uh, so it was just a, a weird claim to make, but one that Elizondo felt that he could be quoted on in the top of the article, but Elizondo claims it wasn't until the IG investigated his complaint of Reed's alleged vendetta and smear campaign against him 
that Reed was dismissed. So now Elizondo just goes for it. He says, it's my complaint, the one that I submitted in 2021. It's not until I did that, that Reed was dismissed. And it was all about UFOs. Well, that's fascinating to me, if that is true. The problem is, no one can back that up, not even Mr. Elizondo. Now, we can say till our face turns blue that it was about UFOs and it was Elizondo's complaint, and, and that very well may be true. But there's one problem here, and that is the Department of Defense Office of the Inspector General will not openly comment that they've done an, an investigation on this, on Elizondo's complaint. So we are stuck with a very important unanswered question. Was there an investigation and has it completed? Yes, that's one question with two parts. So that is unanswered. They, in my opinion, I'd love to see an example, and, and I will admit being wrong. If an accusation is made against somebody and the IG decides to investigate it, I highly doubt they will take action until the investigation or evaluation or inquiry or whatever you want to call it is done. I think we can all agree on that, right? If you say so-and-so is inappropriate with me, the boss is not going to go, you're fired and let's go ahead and investigate. No, that's not going to happen. Be put on leave without pay? Sure. With pay? Sure. Lots of things can happen, but not ousted, not fired like everybody's talking about. So what's going on? Why can't anybody be clear on if this investigation even took place? Let alone, is it done? And that's why they took action. Sadly, no one has come forward to prove that yet. I did ask the journalist who wrote that for the Daily Mail. That was not pretty. One didn't respond at all. The other did not appreciate me questioning their reporting. Uh, so no proof was given. Uh, I, I will say they said Elizondo said it. So so when I kind of went back and forth on social media saying, look, can you can you guys back it up? They essentially meaning the, the one journalist that did respond, Christopher Sharp said, well, Elizondo said it. It's attributed to him. I'm paraphrasing there, but essentially saying that's your that's your, you know, printed source. So fine, it's going to fall on Elizondo. We have not seen any proof yet. Brian Bender chimed into the conversation. He's obviously been following this since day one, namely because he's been around since day one when it came to the Luis Elizondo story. And even he fired back and said, and Tara Jones does not have Gary Reed's job. Tara Jones would be the mistress. Will they correct their story, meaning the Daily Mail? I'd fall, fall out of my chair if they do. Essentially, he knows it's bunk. It's exaggerated, it's untrue, and they won't correct it. It's a mess. Yet the source was Luis Elizondo. We know that by the journalist and the writing. So why? Why are we setting up this entire narrative but can't prove it? Guy's likely a scumbag, but that's not what we're talking about. We need to actually prove that UFOs and Elizondo's complaint led to his ousting. If it didn't, why are we making claims that we can't back up? When we can back it up, I'll be the first to bring it to you. Back to the complaint, the next person that Elizondo mentioned is Susan Goff. Now, Susan Goff, if you're not aware, is one of the Pentagon spokespeople, but the sole Pentagon spokesperson who comments on UAP slash UFO slash Luis Elizondo issues and ATIP and OSAP and all that that goes along with it. I've said it a million times on this channel, but if you're not aware, she literally is the sole person. Everything gets routed from the DIA, from the Navy, from the Department of Defense. If it has something to do with UAP, UFOs, or Luis Elizondo, or ATIP, it goes right to Susan Goff. I'm not going to say that's a good or bad thing. It's bad because a lot of times you can't get a response, but sometimes it's also good. It may add to... Uh, being able to just go to one source. But again, it's a question mark on if you get the answer. But she has become the poster child of evil when it comes to the Pentagon. I mean, if anybody looks on Twitter, you know, I'm not exaggerating there, because there are literally a pile of memes that have been created by some very nasty people. Now, you may not like Susan Goff, 
you may not care for her. You may think she's lying through her teeth, but there are some vicious things going around about people, including Susan Goff, that I think shouldn't be involved in this conversation. But that in turn has created this aura around her that she is the one that is spearheading this movement against Luis Elizondo. I don't believe that is founded. Uh, I don't think that's a warranted accusation, but a lot of people will fall back that she is the linchpin to this entire cover-up. We have to remember being a spokesperson is her job, and she is conveying a message on behalf of the Department of Defense. That's not me defending Susan as a person, but rather the position that I've understood for quite a long time what a spokesperson does. And you don't have to care about Susan Goff, but you do have to care about the fact that she is speaking for the department, not herself. So that's an important distinction that I think a lot of people forget. If it turns out that she is to be blamed for some of this, cool. I will bring that to you as well. But until then, she's just the spokesperson. She's the messenger. The status here, military reserve, some civilian employee, um, very well could be true. I know that she was, I think, a colonel, lieutenant colonel. Uh, regardless, uh, you know, I know she, that she served in the military likely as a civilian employee. The rest was blank. Here's her LinkedIn page. Um, this is all public information. Uh, n I've never had the intention to dox anybody. Uh, this is all, again, uh, public so that so she's easily found in, in that regard. But I want to stop before I get to the third person named and accused uh, in the complaint and talk about somebody who's not accused and named in the complaint as somebody who's filing. And that is the guy who made the original statement that started this entire avalanche of accusations against the Pentagon that they were smearing Luis Elizondo. I am still open to the fact that they are doing that, but this brings up a very important question that nobody has been able to answer when the, uh, since this IG complaint surfaced. Where is the accusation against Christopher Sherwood? Now, I would imagine a lot of you are going, who's that? Well, if you've paid attention, he's the original guy that said Mr. Elizondo had no responsibilities with regard to the ATIP program while he worked in OUSDI, the Office of Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, up until the time he resigned, effective 10-4-2017. That was first printed by The Intercept and journalist Keith Clore. Now, where is he in this complaint? You'll notice he's mentioned, and we'll go over that. So he's in it, but he's not accused of any wrongdoing. Why not? There's no evidence that Susan Goff, who later surfaced by the way she was not around when that when that comment first surfaced at least not publicly i am open to her playing a role in it but never has that been attributed to her what was attributed to her is when she softened it she later came out in a statement that was first printed by myself then picked up by the new york post quote mr elizondo had no assigned responsibilities for a tip while he was in OUSDI, the Office of Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. So she softened it by adding the word assigned to responsibilities, essentially opening the door that maybe Luis Elizondo did work on it, but he was never assigned slash it was never official. That changes obviously a lot of that narrative, but it was her that inserted that word and was later attributed that quote. But again, Christopher Sherwood was the first to ever have been attributed that particular, we'll call it, shot across the bow. And when that first surfaced, I was shocked. I was, I really truly was. There was already a lot of red flags at play, but when they took that direct, uh, pardon the expression, but just shot across the bow, naming Luis Elizondo, stating that he did not do what he was claiming to have done, where is Christopher Sherwood on the list of those being accused of wrongdoing? And he's absent. Going back to the complaint, the third and final of who was mentioned is Neil Tipton. Likely, a lot of you have not heard of him either. He was a civilian employee as tagged here. 
Here's his official DOD bio. Mr. Neil Timpton serves as the Director for Defense Intelligence Collection and Special Programs, Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. I'm not going to read the whole bio, but just, I mean, listen to this. It's just impressive when you read anybody's bio that has all this. Mr. Tipton has been with the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense uh, since 2007. He has held a broad range of leadership positions for the office, director, clandestine operations, global access, a mission integration and director, geoint and SIGIN support, director, information sharing and partnership engagement, and IPT lead for information sharing and collaboration for the SecDef's ISR task force, deputy director, SIGINT and cyber, and as OUSDI senior advisor for technical collection. And it goes on for there from there. So I always like to read those just to kind of give some background. Like we're talking about some pretty heavy hitters within the Pentagon, within the DOD, and within these offices that are being accused of wrongdoing. And in fact, I will let Luis Elizondo tell you what the accused, um, I don't want to say charges, but essentially what the accusations are. In here, what did the persons do or fail to do that was wrong? And in uh, Mr. Elizondo's words, conducted retribution and provided false information to the public, abusing government authority, illegal destruction of information. When did the incidents occur? 2018. To present. When were you made aware of the problems? 2017. Obviously a mistake because the problems didn't occur until a year after he was made aware of them. That doesn't make sense. I'm not trying to nitpick, but these are serious accusations to make. So we should nitpick. How can you find out a year prior? Where did the incidents take place? Pentagon. What rule, regulation, or law do you believe to have been violated? Whistleblower Protection Act, multiple DOD directives, instructions, and the Freedom of Information Act. Briefly summarize how you believe our office can assist you regarding your matter. IG should conduct a comprehensive review, inquiry, investigation into abuse of power, lying to the public, destruction of evidence, conspiracy. So those are his words. Mr. Elizondo also said, have you reported this matter to any other organization or agencies? Mr. Elizondo checked no. I want to read these certifications to you because this speaks volumes to a lot of people. Um, so I'll, I'll read to you this just to make sure that you are aware. Under the certifications, all three check boxes were checked by Mr. Elizondo. And he said the following. I certify that all the statements made in this complaint are true, complete, and correct to the best of my knowledge. I understand that a false statement or concealment of a material fact is a criminal offense. 18 U.S. Code, Section 1001, Inspector General Act of 1978 as amended, Section 7. I've Next uh, checkbox, I have provided my election concerning my filing status in Part 1 of this form release of identity, non-release of identity, or anonymous. If I did not provide my release election, I understand that this will cause a delay in the processing of my complaint. I further understand that if I have elected either confidential or anonymous status, it may impact the ability of the DOD hotline to either conduct an inquiry, if warranted, and or to appropriately address my issues. I also understand that if I elect anonymity without providing any contact information, I will be unable to request confirmation of receipt of this complaint to the DOD hotline or to receive advisements as to open or close status. Last, I understand that if the director DOD hotline determines, determines the allegations in my complaint cannot be investigated without disclosing my identity on a need to know basis to organizations outside the DOD hotline, my lack of permission to release my identity may prevent further action from being taken on my complaint. I further understand that even if I elect confidential status, my identity may be disclosed if required by appropriate legal authority or if the director DOD hotline determines that such disclosure is otherwise unavoidable. So he checked all those boxes that certifies what he's saying. Obviously, no penalty under perjury or anything like that, uh, but it would be a violation of the us code up here so obviously a no-no so that goes a long way with a lot of people so i wanted to make sure that i really did highlight that in his defense 
Going on in the complaint, this was obviously submitted 3 May 2021. If I haven't uh, mentioned that yet, you can see this is essentially the cover letter on top of the uh, complaint itself. What we just went over were the DOD hotline forms that needed to be filled out. Here is his cover letter from top to bottom. My name is Luis D. Elizondo, and the purpose of this letter is to request an official U.S. Department of Defense Inspector General inquiry slash investigation into malicious activities, coordinated disinformation, professional misconduct, whistleblower reprisal, and explicit threats perpetrated by certain senior level Pentagon officials, including the Director of Defense Intelligence for Intelligence and Security, Gary Reed, Public Affairs Officer Susan Goff, and other officials who were complicit in these acts. And close with this letter are details of the complaint for your review. The first portion is a comprehensive chronological listing of events that substantiate my involvement in the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP. The second portion is a detailed listing of events and actions to substantiate this complaint along with evidence which suggests a coordinated effort to obfuscate the truth from the American people while impugning my reputation as a former intelligence officer at the Pentagon. These negative actions against me have resulted in great personal and professional challenges to me and my family. Over the last three years, attempts to clear the record by some senior officials serving as witnesses to this abuse have been ignored by certain elements within the Office of the Secretary of Defense, staff namely within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Furthermore, evidence exists that substantiates my claim that there may be deeper conspiracy within the OSD staff to circumvent DOD policy, rules and regulations, and perhaps even law. At a very minimum, actions have been taken against me that directly erode the very foundation of our national security ethos and the public trust instilled by the American people. I am fully aware of the magnitude of my allegation against certain individuals in the department, and I am able to, sub to substantiate these claims. As reprisals continue to be leveled towards me, I respectfully request DODIG conduct conduct a comprehensive review of all related activities against me over the last three years and correct the record of my involvement in the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Sincerest regards, very respectively, Luis D. Elizondo. Enclosures, see attached. So let's get into now his complaint and the meat of it. This, as he stated, was first the chronological outline proving what he has essentially claimed. Now, you have to keep in mind, this is him putting on paper what he has conveyed, sometimes in part, but there's also a lot of new information as well, but sometimes in part in podcasts and interviews and so on. This doesn't necessarily lock it into stone. Now, I know some of you may cringe at me saying that, but one of the biggest reactions I saw when people read through this chronology was, aha, see, I told you, you know, this is he's telling the truth. Well, no, this is just putting into writing with some names that have been um, uh, stated here with also other names being redacted. My question is, where are those other names if they can essentially back up what Mr. Elizondo is stating? I know some people fire back with Harry Reid, but Harry Reid stated he was never briefed ever on ATIP. So how can he really speak on authority? Uh, I know that we have others that have backed him up, also people that were not directly involved. I want to know from these people what's going on. The people, again, the names that we can see and the names we can't. Let's get them on the record. Where have they been for the last five years, even though some of them have worked uh, since for the DOD? And I understand if they can't come out yet. Others we know, though, have retired, and yet they have remained mum. I want to know why. There could be a very good explanation for it, but I think it should be pointed out that we have a lot of information here with a lot of names, but where are they? And that's what I, what I essentially want to know. Let's get into it. This document is unclassified. Additional classified details slash information which provide specific critical context can be provided over an appropriately secure and accredited means and with a demonstrated need to know. This portion is provided for the purposes of establishing the facts, dates, and points of contact that can verify and validate my involvement with ATIP. June 2008. While assigned as Chief to the Information Sharing and Foreign Intelligence Relationships, or ISFIR Office, Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, 
I was approached by representatives from the Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Applications Program, or OSAP, to provide counterintelligence and security expertise to their office. The two individuals whom I engaged with were identified as both being part of the OSAP effort. Mr. J. Stratton and, redacted, both these individuals were so in, were, and I'm sorry, this, uh, the blackout is a little bit over the words here. Both these individuals were an integral part of the OSAP effort. Our initial meeting occurred in my office at, redacted, contact info, Mr. J. Stratton. Contact info, a redacted name, contact info, a redacted name. Jay Stratton, you'll remember, who is now retired, made headlines as being the head of the UAP task force. Um, I long suspected that, got documented proof from NASA quite some time ago, and then it was also named, um, I believe, in the mainstream media, but I think Brennan McKernan was, was the other one that was, that was named. And you'll see his name coming up too. But that, if you're not familiar with John F. Stratton, that's who that is. And in fact, for you fans of skinwalkers at the Pentagon out there, um, a lot of people believe that to be Axelrod. I have no evidence to support or, or, or go against it. I have no idea, but just kind of throwing that out that that's who our people are talking about. Back to the complaint. For approximately two weeks, three meetings were held at my office. During the meetings, it was revealed to me that OSAP was in need of specific counterintelligence and security support and that my background as a credentialed CI special agent was a necessary skill set. Furthermore, they indicated they required, the required, they required expertise in specific aerospace technology. At the time, neither Mr. Stratton nor Redacted elaborated on the purpose or mission of OSAP, but they indicated that upon a successful evaluation, I'd be referred to the director of the program for further vetting and consideration. A month later, July 2008, after several personal meetings in my office space, Mr. Stratton and Redacted invited me to meet with the OSAP director, Dr. James Lekatsky. I was subsequently provided directions to an undisclosed Defense Intelligence Agency facility in the Roslyn area. I'm surprised that's in there, to be honest with you. That's not to the fault of the New York Post uh, when they published this, but rather Mr. Elizondo putting it in a unclassified document about a undisclosed DIA facility in Roslyn. That's maybe another video for another time. Classified details can be provided over secure means and with a demonstrated need to know. During the meeting, I met with Dr. Lekatsky and I was asked to address him as Jim. Dr. Lekatsky introduced himself as an expert in missile technology and as the director for the OSAP program. It was during this meeting that Dr. Lekatsky provided me the full name of the OSAP portfolio and the focus of the mission. Dr. Lekatsky explained to me my background in the counterintelligence field along with my expertise, excuse me, experience working with advanced aviation technology from a tech protect perspective, made me uniquely qualified to support him. He further explained that OSAP was part of a very sensitive effort that was sponsored by very senior level officials at both the legislative and executive branches. He further indicated to me that all personnel were hand selected. During our discussion, Dr. Lekatsky asked me what I think about UFOs. My response was sincere in that I quote, I don't think about UFOs, not because I don't believe in them but because I simply do not have the luxury to think about them given my mission op tempo or operations tempo or operational tempo, whichever acronym you want to go with, and mission focus. Also July 2008, after one additional follow-on meeting with Dr. Lekatsky at his office space in Roslyn, I was officially asked by Dr. Lekatsky to assume the role of OSAP's chief of counterintelligence and security. He explained to me that this effort was fully endorsed by senior DIA leadership and he had already received approval by the program's sponsors. Former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, Senator Ted Stevens, and Senator Daniel Inouye. What's odd about this is the insertion and endorsement of a DIA decision by senators. The DIA is a military intelligence arm you generally don't have s senators wielding their power and calling the shots once the 
programs are underway. Of course, they play a role in the funding. Of course, they may play a role, I guess, in kind of the execution in the beginning. But they're senators. They're not directors. They're not program managers. And they don't wield the power of a military intelligence arm. So why they would be essentially named here, maybe they were being briefed. But keep in mind that Harry Reid already told New York Magazine in the last couple of years prior to his passing that he was never briefed on ATIP or, or essentially OSAP. So where are we getting the endorsement from if he's not being briefed? And according to him in his own words, none of that was his style. So he stayed out of it. These are all things that just don't make sense when you look at what people say. And then you look at this complaint and what is being claimed. Now, I'm not saying Mr. Elizondo is making this up, but rather maybe he was hearing false information like, yeah, 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 Senator Harry Reid's all over this, when in reality, Harry Reid had nothing to do with it. Well, that was according to Harry Reid. But then now he's an authority before his passing, being asked to endorse Mr. Elizondo's role in this. It's kind of a mess. Again, you know, you can beat these dead horses, but you have to nitpick at this level because we're making accusations against people. And we're making claims that just don't make sense when you look at the totality of the evidence and testimony that's available to us. I also want to point out one tweet that in May of 2021, Luis Elizondo made about OSAP. Now, apparently there was um, some frustration, or at least that's how I read his tweet here, that he felt the need to, to go to Twitter and to squash the myth that he was involved with OSAP. And he says, and I'll quote, it's been brought to my attention that despite my constant assertion in the media about my non-involvement in OSAP, some are under the false impression that I was a part of it. For the record, again and again, I was not part of OSAP. That's strange because That was May 10th, 2021, within a week of him submitting all these chronological details on his involvement with OSAP. Now, for those of you who have watched Stephen Greenstreet's uh, documentary on the New York Post channel in the basement office, uh, he did a great job breaking all of this down. But I think the point needs to be looked at again as we go through this complaint word by word and, and see that that is not necessarily the case. Now, before some of you throw bad comments my way, I'll get to Mr. Elizondo's response to the response when he addressed those allegations, but sit tight for that. August 2008, while supporting the OSAP effort, I was informed by Dr. Lekatsky and other OSAP personnel about a specific effort within the portfolio known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program and that most of my efforts would be focused on that aspect of the project. I was informed that this effort involved collecting data and evidence from military personnel who came into contact with unidentified aerial phenomena, a term that was then explained to me as the government nomenclature for unidentified flying objects. Furthermore, I was asked to develop a comprehensive counterintelligence and security plan for this effort to protect the program from possible foreign intelligence service penetrations. That part makes sense. And yes, he even said, I'm going to focus on the ATIP aspect of this. We can also throw in the fact that a couple people said that ATIP was just a nickname for OSAP. So now we are playing semantics a little bit, but the people that were involved in these programs can't agree with the structure of the programs themselves. Dr. Lekatsky and Dr. Hal Putoff have both said, ATIP was just a nickname for the OSAP effort. Here, clearly, Mr. Elizondo is trying to differentiate the two. What's right? What's wrong? I'll let you decide, but it's still a mess. And it's an important mess. Just, again, I, I won't go into why I've done that quite a few times on this channel, but if some of you are scratching your head going, well, who cares? From a standpoint of trying to unravel all of this, it is absolutely critical to figure out the difference between OSAP and ATIP. Was it a nickname? Was it not? Were they two different programs? And depending upon who you listen to, you get multiple answers. And that's what makes it very difficult to try and figure out, especially when you're trying to find evidence, what really is going on. 
September 2008 to June 2009. During this time, I created a counterintelligence and security posture for both OSAP and ATIP. Furthermore, I attended senior level debriefings, including one with a foreign, a former foreign military member with a general officer rank that was arranged by Dr. Lekatsky. I was also present for numerous written updates by Dr. Lekatsky to the director of DIA and other senior DIA officials regarding OSAP, ATIP, which were well received. Ample correspondence exists between DIA senior staff and Dr. Lekatsky that substantiates DIA leadership was not only supportive, but also in favor of the OSAP ATIF efforts being expanded, efforts to be expanded. I am personally aware of both meetings and briefings in which OSAP and ATIP were discussed, and I was privy to several classified emails that substantiate this fact. Those emails still exist within a specific office of the Pentagon in both electronic and hard copies. Details and specifics as to this information can be provided separately over a secure means. It was during this time we also conducted a review over a draft 10-month report executed by one of the prime contractors, Bigelow Aerospace. Details and specifics as to this information can be provided separately over a secure means. Let me just interject here. This is the 10 month report that a lot of people talk about that's talked about in skinwalkers at the Pentagon, that the cover page was leaked and was reviewed by a journalist. If we're alluding to the 10 month report and details within being classified, hence why he can't discuss it more, meaning Mr. Elizondo in this unclassified document, then there's something wrong because there was no indicator that that 10 month report was even a government document, let alone classified. Would it be exempt? Maybe we can argue that in a, in a different video and that just kind of gets into legal mumbo jumbo, but no indicator that it was classified. There's even no indicator again, that it was a government document. So why the reference to the, the needed to be under secure means, I don't know. Maybe maybe that's less about classification, more about what was going on with a government contractor that can't be in a unclassified document, and that would be exempt but not classified under FOIA. Sure, I can buy that. But that just like there's a couple things that just don't make sense there. June 2009, it was brought to my attention that a request was sent by former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid to DOD senior leadership to further protect ATIP by requesting the effort be transitioned into a protected special access program. Furthermore, I was informed that key individuals that were associated with ATIP were included slash listed as part of the request for SAP protection, my name being one of those individuals. The request was sent from Senator Harry Reid to the Deputy Secretary of Defense through official correspondence channels. That's the Harry Reid letter, which I've done videos on. Uh, interesting story, but that's what he's referring to there. July 2009 to January 2010. New leadership at DIA began to create challenges for Dr. Lekatsky, despite the previous leadership fully endorsing the efforts. Redacted was the redacted of DIA and began attempts to shut down the effort. As was explained to me by colleagues, there was a religious aversion to the subject matter by certain members of DIA and the OSD staff. In September 2009, I was privy to an internal email between Redacted and OUSDI Congressional Affairs. Redacted were both where both were lamenting the existence of the programs and were attempting to, quote, kill the effort because it involved that crazy UFO topic again. In October 2009, I was asked to attend a meeting within the OS, OUSDI SAPCO spaces in which I was told specifically that this effort should be discontinued and that although this topic was real, it had supernatural origins and not consistent with certain religious views of specific senior leadership. I reported the results of this meeting to Dr. Lekatsky. February 2010 to April 2010, Dr. Lekatsky indicated to me that he was facing increased pressure by DIA leadership and he would be forced to resign from his duties as the director of OSAP and ATIP and returned to headquarters DIA. Dr. Lekatsky was in poor spirits at the time because he believed he was being unfairly persecuted for his role in an authorized mission. 
April 2010, Dr. Likatsky approached me and asked if I would consider assuming the role of OSAP and ATIP director. I reminded Dr. Likatsky that most of my experience concerned the ATIP portfolio and that I only worked OSAP from a tangential perspective. Dr. Likatsky's response to me was that he already had my name floated as the new director with leadership and that it was unanimously agreed by all that I should be the new director. He also suggested that I manage the manage the effort under my authorities as a member of the OSD staff and not keep it within DIA due to hostile environment he was experiencing. After a day of considering his offer, I accepted the responsibility provided that all stakeholders supported this decision. I also informed Dr. Lekatsky that I would begin to engage with select OUSDI senior staff members to gain additional mission support. May 10th to May 10th, excuse me, May 2010 to August 2012. In my new role as director for ATIP and OSAP, I made the decision to begin minimizing existing efforts within the OSAP portfolio given the negative attention it was receiving by DIA leadership. A reminder again that for more than two years in his chronological breakdown, he was the director of OSAP. And even though he states that he was essentially minimizing that part of the effort, he obviously still played a role. To what extent? We don't know. According to him, absolutely none. Then all of a sudden, for more than two years, he's listing himself as the director of both programs. But keep in mind, the director the former director of OSAP, including Dr. Hal Putoff, said they were the exact same thing, but a nickname. Go figure. I want to get to his tweets because after the New York Post aired their video and pointed some of these things out, uh, Mr. Elizondo got a little frustrated again and fired back. This was his tweet thread. Um, he doesn't do them in tweet threads the way you normally do tweet threads. He kind of tweets out a bunch of numbers and sometimes uh, kind of skips numbers. So you have to go back to his timeline. This is it pieced together. This is what he said on May 12th. Against my better judgment, I am climbing down into the morass to address yet another mischaracterization based on cherry picking of information. I've always maintained that I was only tangentially can never pronounce that word right, involved in OSAP and my focus was on standing up a CI and security capability for ATIP. In 2010, when asked to take over ATIP, the OSAP portfolio came with it, even though I had no problematic or operational involvement in OSAP. Within 24 hours, my deputy and myself decided we would only focus on the ATIP portion of the effort, which is precisely what happened. In the future, I encourage folks to be cognizant of individuals with agendas. This is a complex issue. People who were not there or part of the effort at the time simply don't know. Fortunately, the DOD IG is aware of the relevant details, and as I have maintained, the truth will be proven in the end. Be cautious of people bearing false witness. My involvement in OSAP was only in name as a matter of pro forma because it was the broader effort initially. Remember, just because you work on the Corvette assembly line doesn't mean you are involved in all Chevy products. I don't believe that that um, last statement is is relevant as, as kind of a uh, comparison. Uh, you can see here when he posted this on Twitter, uh, the conversation, again, was about his words versus his words. And what doesn't make sense here is he obviously went into detail about creating security plans and all this stuff for OSAP. That's being part of it. So why then in the previous year was he so adamant about saying, I had no involvement whatsoever? Here he says DODIG is aware, and they are aware in his own chronological breakdown, being the director for more than two years. Granted, saying that he then weighted his attention to the ATIP side versus OSAP, but what's interesting is he says, People who were not there or part of the effort at the time simply don't know. 
Well, fine, we can take them out of the equation. Me, Stephen Greenstreet, Mick West, whomever wants to be labeled as an evil skeptic uh, to some of these claims, that's all well and good. Problem is the people that were there, Dr. James Lekatsky, Dr. Hal Putoff, I believe Dr. even Dr. Eric Davis had said that it was a nickname. They all disagree about the hierarchy and relationship between OSAP and ATIP as a program and as an overall effort. Yes, it's important to the story. Because if he is completely drilling home that people were not there, they just don't know, why can't we address the people that were there? Do they not know? There's a lot of other questions that go along with that posed by those who were there, like the funding, for example, when in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, the former director of OSAP said ATIP didn't have any funding. Then Luis Elizondo comes around and says, yes, we did. ATIP was said to have $22 million as published by the New York Times, right? Luis Elizondo stood up in front of the MUFON audience that was taped by To The Stars Academy and sent out as, as kind of a history of the ATIP program, talking about the $22 million, what it bought, and he outlined all the objectives. It echoed OSAP, almost verbatim, pretty much verbatim. Yet he didn't have any role in it. So where did that money come from? that he was talking about. Again, it's a mess. So the people that were involved and you look at what was said, you look at what was in the complaint, none of it matches up. To continue on from page three to four in that um, uh, first part of the chronology, it was my observation that key elements within DIA were attempting to hide anything related to OSAP simply due to perceived sense of stigma. As such, I focused on our remaining I focused our remaining efforts on ATIP given that there was ample information, data, and evidence which we continued to receive that indicated continued incursion into controlled U.S. airspace, both continental United States and outside the continental United States. Details and specifics as to this information can be provided separately over a secure means. During this time period, my office had multiple meetings with eyewitnesses to, con to include pilots, radar operators, and ship's crew. Furthermore, emails were being sent to my office at the classified level over the Secure Internet Protocol Router Network, or SIPRNET, and Joint Worldwide Intelligence Communications, JWIX, concerning incidents involving unidentified aerial phenomena activity. There were numerous emails from senior military service members and leadership that substantiate the fact that the threat was real. The email still exists with an OUSDI. Details and specifics as to this information can be provided separately over secure means. September 2012. As initial funding was exhausted for the ATIP program, we successfully secured an additional $10 million through Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. This funding was to be used for fiscal years 13 and 14. However, the verbiage used in the appropriations was sufficiently vague, wherein another office with an OUSDI, managed by, redacted, used the funding to support academic studies involving intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. October 2013, while also working as chief for the newly formed Intelligence Sharing and Partner Engagement Office, under the OUSDI, I had the opportunity to brief ATIP to the Director of Foreign Material, OUSDI redacted. During 2013, I introduced him to other members of ATIP and its scientists. Redacted attended numerous ATIP meetings where we discussed the role of DOD FMA efforts to support ATIP, along with logistics and facilities. Details and specifics as to this information can be provided separately over secure means. It was at this time I informed my supervisor, Mr. Neil Tipton, of my work in a parallel portfolio and my need to gain experience from the ISR task force given the nuanced nature of analysis we were conducting. Mr. Tipton indicated he had no issue with me working other efforts as long as my duties were not neglected at ISPE. Details and specifics as to this information can be provided separately over a secure means. So his supervisor, Neil Tipton, was being told about a parallel portfolio. To me, that just sounds like something that he was doing on the side, sorry. That's what that means. And as long as it did not interfere with his duties of what he was supposed to do, which was working as the chief of the newly formed Intelligence Sharing and Partner Engagement Office, 
that he had no problems with it. So that's wildly different than the stories that were printed in the media and what we've been told. But there you have it in his own words that his direct supervisor was told, hey, I'm doing this other thing over here, uh, but it won't in interfere with my essentially real job here. And the supervisor says, yeah, as long as it doesn't interfere, go right ahead. Again, different. I know he said that his supervisor didn't know what he was doing, but that for me is a different context on how he always said it. Now we have it in writing. Early 2014, my office received a very compelling video in 2011 sent to us on JWIX that was collected by a sensitive U.S. platform operating in a denied area. The video was approximately 18 to 20 minutes in duration and appeared to show three UAPs flying in a distinct triangle formation. I'm going to stop right there. This is such a common, and, and I was really surprised to see this. This is such a common mistake when talking about UFOs and they're flying in a triangle. Whenever you have three points in the sky, unless they were parallel and make a line, you get a triangle each and every way you put it. Three dots, if not in a line, make a triangle. So what is a distinct triangle? I'm not really sure. But regardless, it will always be a triangle. So for the guy who's been studying UFOs for years now through ATIP, the fact that he has to say that is just weird to me. Because that is always something that people... Um, and I'm not trying to harp on UFO witnesses, but those that will see three lights in the sky and go, look, it's a triangle. Well, you can't have three lights in the sky and have it not be a triangle. It's just going to be different types of triangles. So that's what I don't understand about him stating this. Regardless, let's move on. After vetting the video through several intelligence community experts, I decided to share it with Mr. Tipton in 2014 to see if he was aware of any blue force technology that can explain what was being witnessed on the video. Mr. Tipton's response to me was that the video was, quote, weird and compelling, and that he had no idea what the object was. Details and specifics as to this information can be provided separately over secure means. I don't know if this is the same as the quote unquote famed 23 minute video. Um, I, I mean, it sounds different where that's a, either a triangle coming out of the water or I don't know. I can't keep all these legends and, and rumors straight. But regardless, here now we have a 20 ish minute video being referenced uh, by Mr. Elizondo. I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know what to add other than when he talks about Blue Force um, technology. I wanted to throw this in here because there was a lot of questions on what exactly did that mean? Some people pulled up. There's actually a company named Blue Force. That is not it. You have to keep in mind, Luis Elizondo is United States Army or former United States Army. So he uses a lot of U.S. Army phraseology in this, Blue Force being one of them, because their tracking network called the Blue Force Tracking or BFT is uh, all an Army program. You can see it here. It started in 2002, BFE, or excuse me, BFT provides friendly force tracking information as integrated on more than 98,000 platforms across the Army and Joint Services. So essentially, it's for, for tracking friendly forces. So I believe what Mr. Elizondo was alluding to here to his supervisor was, hey, do we have anything to kind of support that they, this was potentially friendly forces or, or something that we can uh, track using that network? Uh, I believe it's it's likely one of those two two possibilities there, uh, but that's why he brought that up. That's what the blue force tracking is. 2015, I briefed the ATIP portfolio to Redacted, who was at the time senior executive U.S. Air Force detailee to OUSDI. At the time, his staff and mine shared office space at Redacted, and he was instrumental in providing me advice and assistance. My hope was to use Redacted as an interlock. Um, interlocular with the U.S. Air Force, redacted in order to understand the UAP issue from an Air Force perspective. Redacted and I collaborated frequently and had lunch over the matter. I introduced him to several members of ATIP and he was genuinely interested in the topic. He was also aware that Redacted was briefed into ATIP and there were a select few individuals who would receive briefings from my staff and me. Upon his departure from OUSDI, 
I provided, redacted, a small token of our appreciation for his support by providing a one-of-a-kind original photograph of an Apollo astronaut on the moon with a handwritten note. This photo was later shown to Bre Mr. Brennan McKernan, the current UAP task force director, by redacted as evidence he was aware of our effort and a supporter. An odd note there, but there's Brennan McKernan's name. Uh, I believe Politico was the first one to publicly post that. He was a name I was watching for quite some time and have had open FOIA requests also for a couple years uh, to try and track down what his role with the UAP task force was, what he discovered, and so on. 2014 to 2016, my office was routinely engaged with other members of the intelligence community in a formal working group specifically organized for the purposes of discussing and assessing UAP activity. This not only included older incidents, the 2004 USS Nimitz, but recent incidents being reported by U.S. naval ship captains in theaters of engagement. These in incidents were often accompanied by video evidence taken from U.S. weapon platforms. In one such instance, a senior member of the U.S. Navy sent an email pleading for guidance as to what he slash she should do if they encounter more UAPs. This documentation still exists with OUSDI. Details and specifics as to this information can be provided separately over a secure means. It was at this time I also assumed the new role as the Director of National Program Special Management Staff, a National Security Council effort involving Guantanamo Bay. 2015 to 2017. On a regular basis, Mr. Stratton, who was assigned at the time at as a STRATCOM liaison officer and Mr. Brennan McKernan, current UAP task force director, and I would discuss new reports that were received and engaged in a larger working group discussion with other elements within the IC. These meetings were conducted in designated OSD and Navy sensitive compart compartmented information facilities or SCIF spaces within the Pentagon or Suitland Naval Air Station. I've looked up Suitland Naval Air Station. I believe that is a mistake. I don't believe that there is a Suitland Naval Air Station. Not then, not now. I'm a little confused at that. I think that this is a reference to, I believe, ONI, uh, the Office of Naval Intelligence. And I believe Suitland is the street it's on. I tried to see if there was maybe some historical reference. Um, I didn't find one. That doesn't mean that it's not there. It's just kind of a weird error to make. Uh, I checked with uh, an, an expert more than me on these types of things. They had never heard of Suitland Naval Air Station either. They also believed it was a mistake. So just a weird kind of thing to throw in there and, and be mistaken on what the Naval Air Station that you're meeting at is. Expertise ranging from, and, and I've apologize for sometimes squinting and being tongue-tied here the way that i have to read this while i'm broadcasting to you guys it does get a little bit blurry on the monitor as i go through the presentation so i apologize expertise ranging from electro optical experts to radar engineers would be utilized to try and ascertain some of the observations and what models of physics would be required to explain uap performance it was also suggested that a joint operational plan be developed through the joint staff to potentially elicit a behavior slash response to UAP activity. In 2016, a formal op plan was drafted and submitted through alternate, alternative compensatory control measure ACCM channels. The op plan was significant in detail, including the frequency of incursions by UAP location and type. At one point, a comprehensive listing of UAP activity was included for the entire month. Details and specifics as to this information can be provided separately over a secure means. I'm not going to say this everywhere. I filed a ton of cases based on the information within this. Obviously, that op plan was one of them. Uh, what I cringe at is it said it was drafted. If it's considered a draft, it's a question mark and a crapshoot on whether or not I'll be able to get it under FOIA as draft documents are exempt. Hopefully it got finalized, but I do have open cases for pretty much anything that we're going over. I went through this with a fine tooth comb. I likely have a request for it. 2016. During this time, my former supervisor, Mr. Tipton, had returned to the OUSDI after completing an IC joint duty assignment at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. In his new role, he was assigned under the redacted for redacted. 
In his new role, I believe Mr. Tipton, Mr. Tipton could be con a continued value to our ATIP efforts. In late 2016, I sent Mr. Tipton an email on JWIC's wel welcoming him back to OUSDI. Mr. Tipton responded with an email with subject line, that UFO video. In his email to me, Mr. Tipton asked how my efforts were going at ATIP and if we were able to gain additional fidelity on a specific UAP video. I shared with him the prior year while he was my supervisor at ISPE. So that was that 18 to 20 minute video. My response was negative. During the time, I also asked Mr. Tipton if his new office could be helpful in our endeavors involving UAPs. He suggested I speak directly with Redacted. In December 2016, I briefly spoke to Redacted and explained that our funding for fiscal year 13 and 14 was taken by another office and our resources were very slim, but that the mission was very viable. He shared with me his support for our effort, but indicated he would be leaving for another position soon and that I should keep Mr. Tipton in the loop. I also shared with my uh, redacted my frustration for not being able to brief other senior leadership due to restrictive stove piping, but I had received exceptional support from one of his subordinates. Redacted in the past. Redacted appreciated the compliment. 2016. During this time, I continually attempted to gain additional senior level leadership involvement. My direct supervisor, Redacted, was informed by me that I was also involved in another sensitive effort besides NPSMS. Redacted indicated he was fine with my involvement in other government endeavors, provided it did not interfere with my performance as a director of the NPSMS. It was during this time I introduced Redacted to other members of the ATIP staff, including Mr. Brennan McKernan. Although we never specified ATIP involved UAP, he was aware of the sensitive nature of the effort and the strict need to know aspects of the program, which he respected. Redacted was later asked to provide information on a 2013 FBI investigation called Redacted, for which the sworn statements or 302s would be useful for our efforts. The investigation involved potential UAP activity near a sensitive US government facility. Details and specifics as to this information can be provided separately over a secure means. There is the second time that bosses or people in power within this DOD structure are informed of kind of this side effort. Hey, we're doing this, potentially utilizing clearances and so on to access whatever information. And I am not minimizing that effort. My whole point in pointing this out is this is what people like me were lambasted for for even even giving the idea out that potentially this was something that was done on the side that this was not their effort as kind of indicated and and what so many people said in in interviews and so on and and what was printed in the media and so on about this government ufo program investigating uap rather we're talking about group chats meetings and skiffs, which again are secured areas and, and great, but multiple supervisors and again, people in power are being told, hey, this is my job and I know this and it's not a tip, but over here I'm I, on my own time, it won't interfere, I'm doing this other effort and they're like, yeah, as long as your normal effort is not um, you know, affected at all, go ahead and do it. These are all important because this goes into what we've been fed for years about this government program, when in reality, it likely was not that. All of this information is being talked about. All of it, photos, videos, naval captains and ship captains, all calling and sending all this stuff to ATIP. Yet there were only three videos that Mr. Elizondo requested. And we'll get into this in a couple minutes with the videos, but only three videos that he was going to utilize for his internal use only database. None of that makes sense. If there was all that information, if he wanted to use that for his internal effort, which he told me, I'll play it, play you the clip. But what he told me, why only three? And why those three? And I don't I don't have the answer to that. But what you look at what's publicly available and what we've been told, you look at what's in this complaint, it yet again 
does not match up. It was during this time I grew increasingly frustrated by the lack of resources and interest by senior leadership. UAP reporting to our office was increasing, yet our resources were minimal and leadership involvement was almost non-existent. In 2016, we succeeded in having an unclassified academic study performed by a local university in Washington, D.C. regarding signatures of space threats and capabilities, including intercontinental ballistic missiles, in hopes that this information could be used to determine the various capabilities and domains in which technical assets could be used to better detect UAP activity. The author of the study was only told that our interest was threats from space. The study resides on the ATIP share drive known as Y Project on the JWIX. So obviously a top secret level folder, I went after it. Sadly, you can see on the sidebar here after I filed the case, no records of the, any kind you described could be identified. I did ask for any backups because likely since this time it's been moved. I asked for backups to be searched. I asked for all sorts of, of different ways to find it. Uh, they could not. I have appealed. We'll see what happens. But according to this, this Y Project folder no longer exists. It'd be great if somebody would break down what was on it because then if that was moved somewhere else, we can start trying to specifically ask for those things. Sadly, the folder itself is gone. Late 2016, after increased frustration, I became alarmed by the frequency and duration of UAP activity in and around controlled U.S. airspace. The instances seemed more provocative, and during one instance, they came within feet of a U.S. fighter aircraft. The video of this encounter still exists on the ATIP share drive known as Y Project within the OUSDI JWIC share drive. Out of desperation, I was willing to break protocol and seek the guidance of the DDI for intelligence and security, Mr. Gary Reed. Mr. Gary Reed replaced Redacted as the new DDI INS. However, prior to informing Mr. Gary Reed, I was warned by several individuals that Mr. Gary Reed could not be trusted. It was not told to me at the time why he was not trusted among his peers, other than he had an unusual relationship with his subordinate, Redacted. I was also told that this relationship is widely known within OUSDI and that both Redacted and Mr. Gary Reed occupied positions of significant influence within the counterintelligence security and law enforcement communities. For this reason, I hesitated on briefing Mr. Gary Reed on ATIP efforts. At the time, a third party allegation of sexual harassment was reported to me involving Mr. Gary Reed by one of my office subordinates, Redacted, GG14. During one of the meetings, he referred to Redacted as Bunny and made her feel uncomfortable in the presence of other females, including a USDI attorney and counsel, Redacted. I later learned that a formal IG investigation was initiated, to which I was called as a witness. 2016 to 2017, during this time period, my colleagues within ATIP and I grew increasingly frustrated with the lack of senior level awareness and apathy towards ATIP. It was decided that an effort to have more analytic expertise be made in order that some of the less sensitive videos be made available to broader audiences of expertise. Initially, the idea was to include members of the defense industrial base and other experts to have access to unclassified UAP videos to help determine and assess performance and design characteristics. In 2017, I executed a DOD Form 1910 and submitted through the Defense Office of Pre-Publication and Security Review, or DOPSER, for a security review of three videos, FLIR, GoFast, and Gimbal. Furthermore, I requested through Washington Headquarters Services that this review be coordinated through the Original Classification Authority, or OCA. Although I wanted to limit the distribution of the three unclassified videos to only certain parties, WHS indicated to me it was easier for them to simply authorize unlimited distribution. A few days later, my request via the 1910 was officially stamped by Dopser for unrestricted dissemination. This, in my opinion, is untrue. And this is proved by Mr. Elizondo's own words, as released through the Freedom of Information Act, and 
his own filing of that DD form 1910. That would be this. Now I have a full breakdown video of this, so I'm not going to do it again. But through the Freedom of Information Act, I was able to extract the actual form. Now, granted, it had already leaked before, uh, but uh, this was the official release of it. What was not stated by Mr. Elizondo was the reality behind it was not considered open for public dissemination, but rather it was cleared for what he asked for. And this was another case where in the very beginning, when all this leaked and all this started coming out, and this was a couple years ago, again, me and people like me were getting just obliterated by people saying, how dare you say anything other than what Mr. Elizondo said, because what he said is how it went down. It was legitimate. It was this, it was that. Fine. That all could very well be true. Problem was the evidence just wasn't there to support it. And in my opinion, it was provably wrong. What happened? Fast forward, it was proven wrong. He needed to use this, as he kind of noted in the uh, IG complaint, for internal use only, and that he was not going to be disseminating it outside of that. And there is no indicator in the paperwork that they gave a unlimited distribution at all. And when the Air Force Office of Special Investigation came aboard, they also concluded the exact same thing. In fact, they said here, I won't read the full document, but the DD form 1910 is used for the public release of DOD information. The request for release was no indication the videos would be released to any news outlet. The reason for publication was listed as not applicable, not for publication, research and analysis only, and info sharing with other U.S. government and industry partners for the purposes of developing a database to help identify, analyze, and ultimately defeat UAS or drone threats. That's unmanned aerial systems. Redacted stated he would not have approved the videos for release to the media. Additionally, Redacted never received confirmation the videos were declassified. This redaction here, I believe, was the guy who ultimately reviewed it at the Navy. That would be the OCA or Original Classifying Authority. This, I believe, would be Elizondo, that he never received confirmation the videos were declassified, essentially being able to be released to the world. Even if they were considered unclassified, which they were, that does not authorize a public release of information. This here proved that everything that we, myself included, brought up in the very beginning was proved right. This isn't because Gary Reed instigated this and, and had some power over the investigation. This isn't because all the skeptics said it so many times that the AFOSI goes, oh, okay, let's just go with that. No, this was a formal investigation into the matter and they said that it was wrong. And so therefore, all of that explanation that we were given about all this proper release and so on. So it just doesn't seem accurate the way that it was told to us through coast to coast AM and that first breakdown of how we if you were paying attention learned about the DD form 1910, myself included, it wasn't said in there that Luis Elizondo didn't want it for widespread distribution that he only wanted it internally. No, the impression was given that it was all done to be released to the public. That was untrue. 2017, I was invited by several direct reports to, uh, to Secretary of Defense James Mattis to provide an official ATIP briefing within the SecDef suite redacted SES senior representative to the SecDef my additional meeting, my initial meeting with Redacted was a result of a direct request by Redacted staff at the SecDef's front office. I received a notice on Cipernet and a telephone call asking if I would be available to provide a briefing on ATIP. During the initial meeting, Redacted was provided detailed classified information regarding UAP incursions into controlled U.S. airspace, along with photographs, videos, and classified reports from the field. A week later, I was asked to return and provide a follow-on briefing to the same individual. During the meeting, I was asked for my personal assessment of the situation, in which I expressed my frustration of a lack of senior-level visibility and excessive stovepiping within the department. 
Redacted was sympathetic to our situation in ATIP and asked if we provide a briefing to his colleague, Redacted. I want to know where all these redacted names are. Again, it's been five years. Um, if the DOD is denying this, if any of these people are gone, we know of at least one, uh, and they're no longer with the DOD, let's get some names out there. Let's get some testimony. I'm, I'm, I'm so open to hear it. So these are all great stories, but if we can't verify any of it, they're just stories. Redacted to the Secretary of Defense, I received several telephone calls on my personal cell phone, voice messages saved and available from Redacted, requesting a briefing on ATIP. As with Redacted, my meetings were arranged by SecDef front office personnel, official calendar invites were executed, and took place in the Secretary's suite. During the initial briefing with Redacted, ATIP data and findings were shared. This meeting lasted for over 60 minutes. At the conclusion of the meeting, a follow-on meeting was requested by Redacted. During the second meeting, Redacted expressed consternation about how to inform the Secretary of ATIP findings, given that there is no permanent USDI in place that the SECDEF was relatively new. Redacted was sympathetic to our program's challenges. After several meetings, Redacted asked me to arrange a briefing from several of the eyewitnesses from the 2004 USS Nimitz investigation, namely the F-18 pilots and the E-2 Hawkeye radar operator that were on station at the time. As a result of his request, I successfully brought in several pilots and the radar operator, along with Mr. McKernan, to provide a full description of the encounter. Redacted was concerned due to his previous experience being an F-18 pilot himself, after the meeting, Redacted asked for us to return and brief his colleagues, Redacted. Electronic voicemails are available to confirm meetings with Redacted in the SecDef suite. Redacted line here. After several meetings with Redacted, I was introduced to Redacted, who was the secretary senior liaison to one of the members of the IC. Details and specifics as to this information can be provided separately over secure means. Redacted expressed her concerns briefing the SecDef until she had more information from other members of the IC. She indicated that she would reach out to her colleagues and return them with additional guidance. After several weeks of briefings, Redacted indicated that her colleagues and other government agencies are also taking this topic seriously but did not know how to proceed at the time. Redacted indicated her concern about briefing the SecDef until they had a better understanding of the topic and the threat. I explained to Redacted at the time that was not on our side and that action must be taken to inform the Secretary. I informed them of my previous interaction with the Secretary when he was the Marine Expeditionary Unit MEU Commander in Kandahar, Afghanistan, and my experience with the Secretary is that he would prefer to be informed sooner rather than later. July 3, October 2017, based upon meetings with SecDef Suite, Redacted and Redacted agreed that the ATIP portfolio should be handled by a senior member of OUSDI, preferably with the ranked rank of seasoned SES. The reason for this was to ensure sufficient authority could be used to leverage internal resources within the department to gain additional fidelity on the UAP threat to controlled military airspace. It was at this point, Redacted and Redacted agreed that Mr. McKernan and I brief Mr. Tipton about the decision by the front office. From July to late September, Mr. McKernan and I had several personal meetings with Mr. Tipton to brief him on the nuances of ATIP. Mr. Tipton agreed to assume the management role of ATIP under the condition that I remain an advisor and part of the ATIP construct. Emails were exchanged between Mr. Tipton, Mr. McKernan, and myself that substantiate Mr. Tipton's awareness of the ATIP program and his new leadership role. Per guidance from Redacted and redacted, I drafted an official memorandum assigning my ATIP responsibilities to Mr. Tipton for SECDEP approval and signature. Mr. Tipton received the memorandum and voiced his approval. All right, so I'm going to jump to the actual emails. Uh, they are, there are four pages. They're in chronological order, so I rearranged them from what was in the actual complaint itself. And I'm going to try and make the best sense of this uh, that I can. So you can see here, Luis Elizondo email to Brennan McKernan and, and CC to Neil Tipton. Greetings, Brennan. I briefly spoke to Mr. Neil Tipton, CC above, about our collective efforts and the interest expressed by the front office. Upon your return, I recommend we meet with Mr. Tipton briefly in person. 
He is amicable for a discussion and is aware of redacted previous portfolio. My Mr. Tipton is now the acting director, Defense Intelligence for Technical Collection and Special Programs. Neil, as soon as Brennan returns from leave, we can schedule a quick meeting as promised. Brennan is our Navy counterpart. Up here, August 23, so next day, thanks Lou, added, redacted to help with scheduling, so likely a secretary of some kind. August 25th, 10.35 a.m. from Luis Elizondo to Neil Tipton. Neil, as discussed, thanks for your time with this as the principal SCS and your directorate. I think you are certainly the appropriate representative to help take our effort to a new level. I think by now you probably already know I have been managed. Uh, I have been managing another nuanced effort within the department for some time. In fact, even when I worked for you years ago, you probably guessed I was also working another effort for the department given some of our discussion and raw video. I can't overstate how important I believe this portfolio is with respect to our collective national security. So you are aware, I have already laid the foundation with SecDef's front office, and they support it, to transfer the portfolio under you given your new focus on special programs for the department and USDI. The front office will also brief up the new USDI once he arrives, but I'd hesitate. But I'd be hesitant to brief anyone else at this point, so please keep this at our level for now. Initially, I was going to approach Redacted, but when he handed over the reins to you, I figured you would be the perfect fit. In the coming weeks, I asked you to attend a few meetings with me at the front office in order that you can meet the rest of the players within the building. Later, I will also introduce you to some of our partners in industry and other agencies who are helping lead the charge. Ultimately, I will need your help analyzing and exploiting material this was the area Redacted was particularly helpful with. I have a facility I need to show you that you will be able to use. I always, I sincerely appreciate your help with this and look forward to working with you slash for you once again. Can't think of a better guy to be involved with this, best Lou. P.S. Let me know when you want to go kill some fish. I have access to an awesome 35 Trojan that is a serious fishing machine in the bay. I'll buy the bait. The response uh, sent within the hour, no mention about fish, but Neil Timpton says, thanks Lou, all good. Although at some point I need to know what this actually quote is, unquote. Thanks Neil. So it's clear that Neil Tipton had no idea at this point, like what was going on? I was surprised to see that, especially with the date. And I thought that he was like showing, being shown UFO videos and, you know, sending emails and stuff like that. But anyway, um, hard to kind of keep the chronology of all this straight, but it, it was clear that Neil Tipson just was like, yeah, sure. All good. But I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Hate to put it that way, but that's exactly how I take that particular email. Here's another one, September 11. So fast forward a little bit. Greetings, Neil. A couple, couple quick items for you. Front office is aware that you are now part of this endeavor and they are happy with the decision. We will plan on meeting Redacted next week. How does this Wednesday look for an hour discussion? Lastly, Redacted is a friend of the program. I believe you may be speaking with him tomorrow. He is a good man. Just thought you should know. I knew that phrasing friend of the program would be used. I mentioned that in a, lot, in a video and I had a feeling that that was going to be phraseology that would come up in this. And sure enough, there it is. Thanks, Lou. I'm around next week, but then gone of the week of the 25th on for a specific date time. Just work with Redacted. I'm not allowed to muck around with my calendar, but I am in the building all day the 20th. Yep, have a discussion with Elizondo, or excuse me, with Redacted tomorrow. Thanks, Neil. So, you know, just kind of administrative stuff. September 25, greetings, Neil, per SecDef's front office guidance to you and me. I took the liberty of drafting a memo at the unclassified level that helps you better assume the new responsibilities for ATIP. At your convenience, please review. It's very short on purpose. And let me know if you want me to put more meat on it. Brennan, same with you, please. No pride in authorship. Just want to make sure we answer the mail for the front office. Standing by Lou. Here's Neil Tipton getting spun back up. We'll read and get thoughts back today or tomorrow. Ed Fort Mead, half of the day today. 
I've had FOIA requests for this. You guys may recognize this. This was published in leaked form. It was a little cloak and daggerish. Um, it was kind of like this odd angle and, you know, just kind of zoned in on that one particular area in a popular mechanics article authored by Tim McMillan. I filed requests. Um, once I kind of pieced together Neil Tipton, I forget the date of it, uh, but it's irrelevant. But anyway, I've had it for a couple of years now trying to track down this email. You guys might find it interesting how this all plays out because it is not playing out easy. Uh, and um, until I've got more, I'm not trying to tease you. All I'm saying is this is much more problematic than it should be. So here we have the emails listed in the IG complaint. But the DOD is having a little trouble finding this material. But again, that's not a tease. I don't know more than that other than this request is taking much, much longer than it should. I have open appeals in some, and we'll see how that plays out. Going back to the complaint, finishing it up here. 3 October 2017, after nearly a decade of working with the ATIP portfolio, I decided, decided to resign my position within the Pentagon and submit my resignation letter. I deliberately addressed my resignation letter to the secretary himself, knowing my senior supervisor, Mr. Gary Reed, would not be able to hide it from him. The remaining portion of this document relates to negative actions taken against me to discredit, obfuscate, and misconstrue the truth, resulting in attacks on my credibility and my government responsibilities in which were a matter of public record. This was that undated resignation letter that was submitted. I won't read it all to you, but this is, has been readily available for some time. That was Luis Elizondo's um, resignation letter. And here's the portion of the complaint. So now we've gone through the whole timeline and we've seen a lot of kind of issues and confusion there, in my opinion, discrepancies between what people that who that that were there and 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 who um, were directly involved in OSAP versus what was in this complaint and what Elizondo has said in, in public broadcasts. A lot of that kind of discrepancy stuff we've gone over. But now let's get into Mr. Elizondo's pointed allegations to the three people that I mentioned to you and see where we end up. 5 October 2017, I received a telephone call on my personal cellular telephone from Mr. Gary Reed's executive assistant, in which she said Mr. Gary Reed wanted to speak with me. I reminded her that I was now a civilian and that I was under no obligation to speak with Mr. Gary Reed, but in the spirit of transparency, I would do so. She acknowledged my comment and transferred me to Mr. Gary Reed directly. During the conversation, Mr. Gary Reed asked me what he should do with the letter, and I told him he should do whatever he thinks is prudent, but the letter was intended for the Secretary of Defense. Mr. Reed was clearly upset with me and indicated that he wanted to see me in his office. He also said that he would tell people you are crazy and it might impact your security clearance. I responded to Mr. Gary Reed by telling him that he can take any action he thinks is prudently necessary, but that I was not mentally impaired, nor have I ever violated my security oath. I did not meet personally with Mr. Gary Reed after our discussion, as I feared he would take retribution against me. Note, the fact that Mr. Gar Mr. Reed told me directly he would make efforts to undermine my credibility and clearance by threatening to officially question my mental health shows his personal targeted vendetta and abuse of power against me from the outset of my departure from DOD. The fact is consistent with continued falsehoods repeated by the department statements concerning me and shows a repeated pattern of abuse. The question mark that I had in this particular section was this was the day after he resigned. His official resignation date was for October 2017. According to Luis Elizondo, Mr. Gary Reed within 24 hours was already calling him saying, I'm going to make you look crazy. I'm going to make you look like a fool. I'm going to make you this. I'm going to make you that. But what I don't understand is where in this resignation letter, and I invite you to read it, was there any indicator that Mr. Elizondo was going to go public and start sharing his information to where Gary Reed would have to target him that way? I, I personally, I, I can't really find the connection of, of what he's saying. Is Gary Reed just going to 
make the guy look crazy internally. So that way, if on the off chance, Mr. Elizondo is trying to get some other government contractor position, he'll lose his clearance and can't get it. I don't know. I interviewed Mr. Elizondo in January of 2021. Did, did Then did you know, did he tell you about To the Stars before you resigned? I think it was Jim Semivan who, who, I, who actually said, hey, why don't you consider jumping on board with us? If I remember now, don't hold me to it, but I mean, we're going back three years now. Sure. I'm pretty certain it was Jim who, who actually was the one to offer me a, a position. A pre-resignation or, or post, just for chronological? No, post, post. Post, no, gotcha. Post. I gotcha. So you... Yeah, because I think they knew that I was going to wind up working at... You know, I got to be careful. Though. I, I, I don't want to put a plug in for it. I was going to wind up working you know, at a, at a probably at a supermarket uh, just to... Uh, just to pay my bills afterwards, because, you know, even though I had left the department, I, I, I'm not the age of retirement yet. I can't collect my pension. So, you know, I, I still I still needed employment. So why are we setting up Gary Reed as this vendetta planning person within 24 hours saying, I'm going to make you look crazy, but make him look crazy to who? The checker at the supermarket he was about to work with? No. So that also doesn't make sense with what he was saying. If you don't know what Luis Elizondo said in relation to joining TTSA and what his original plans were, again, working at a supermarket, you might read that and go, aha, see? So this was the plan all along. Mr. Evil scumbag Gary Reed's going to come along. And when he comes public with TTSA, he's going to make him look crazy. And that's the, the, the origin of this whole story. But that's not the story, at least according to Mr. Elizondo. So to make him look crazy, according to Mr. Elizondo, he was out. He was like, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to go bag groceries and I'm going to support my family in a very, um, again, honorable American way and hold a job, but away from government, away from security clearance. And I'm going to work at a supermarket. And yet there's a different story being crafted here within 24 hours of his resignation letter that Gary Reed set it all up that he was going to make him look crazy. Maybe he was going to, but why? What motivation would he? It just kind of comes out of left field in the story. November 2017, back to the complaint. After several telephone calls from former colleagues, redacted, 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 and others within OUSDI warning that Mr. Gary Reed and redacted were coming after me and insinuating I was a fabricator, I decided to obtain private legal counsel to ensure my security clearance would not be in jeopardy. I was informed that Redacted was doing the dirty work for Mr. Gary Reed and they were trying to destroy my reputation at the Pentagon. Knowing that both Gary Reed and Redacted were actively working to hurt my security clearance was and is extremely concerning. On December 17th, 2017, both the New York Times and Politico broke the story about the ATIP program. In both these stories, Pentagon spokesperson Dana White validated the existence of the program and my role as lead. Here's what's interesting about that, because that specifically is more so the Politico, pro, uh, Politico article. There were no attributable quotes to Dana White. She was mentioned, however... She never had an attributable, attributable quote. So why isn't this stuff ever black and white? The one time that we could solve this whole mystery and have an official statement on the record about Luis Elizondo from a Pentagon spokesperson, it happens to have two aspects to the story that we can't get away from. Number one, there is no attributable quote. So it's not that I don't trust Brian Bender, but whenever you're putting something on the DOD, in my opinion, we should have some kind of backed up quote or an email. So maybe you could paraphrase it in the article, but if something starts to get challenged like this, we can share that email. It's public record. They're public statements, not off the record. Yet Mr. Bender, Politico, and no one attached to the story has been able to do that. Second thing that's often forgotten about is Dana White left with a big controversy hanging over her back. She was uh, let out the door with a, with a controversy that, that she was uh, abusing her staff and having them go pick up her dry cleaning and stuff like that. So she was not uh, a, a prime uh, character witness here just simply because she was kind of, she left in disgrace from the DOD. 
So nothing is ever black and white in this story. 18 December 2017, during an interview at CNN headquarters in Washington, D.C., former Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and former Director of National Intelligence General James Clapper indicated to me and my spouse that he was very happy we had a UFO program at the Pentagon and was proud that I ran it. No idea. I mean, okay, so away from the fact that that's hearsay, let's talk about James Clapper. Why would he say that? Proud that he ran it. Well, it's just because they had a a backdoor meeting at CNN because they were being interviewed on the same program at different times. Uh, did Clapper know about like, there should be some kind of context here. And yet there is none. And you'll see uh, quite a few slides from now. But one of the attachments is a photo back back um, stage on CNN's, uh, you know, back back green rooms or wherever they were of James Clapper and Luis Elizondo posing for a photo. But why? Why was he proud? Like, did he just hear the story and say, yeah, well, I'm glad the aerial threats, we should look into it. Well, that's not surprising at all. So again, these kind of things are thrown out there that sound really good. But when you start digging in at the context of it, it doesn't necessarily really play out the way that it was intended. February 2018, after the publishing of a New York Times article about ATIP and my role, I received several more telephone calls from former associates who stated that Mr. Reed had launched an investigation against me through the U.S. Air Force Office of Special Investigations in the hopes of finding derogatory information about me and or to substantiate his claim of mental instability. I was also notified that my DOD computer systems were confiscated in an attempt to determine if I had taken any information with me in an unauthorized manner. That's not too surprising, given the fact that those videos that he wanted for internal use were now blasted on the New York Times, Politico, and pretty much every news outlet imaginable. So in Mr. Elizondo's own words, he, who is attached to the internal process to get him reviewed for what he calls a internal database, why wouldn't you investigate that if these things all of a sudden ended up smashed all over the media? So to, to, to give this type of context to the story, it now makes sense why AFOSI would investigate. Was it instigated by Gary Reed? I don't know. It's quite possible. Who cares? The reality is that per Mr. Elizondo's words, those videos were never supposed to be out in the open. He intended them to be used internally. What happened? They get blasted all over the place. So of course they're going to take it seriously. It doesn't matter if the biggest scumbag within the DOD is out to get anybody. It does not matter. The context of the story actually shows why they would do the investigation. So was it instigated by Gary Reed? It's irrelevant. The truth behind it is videos were blasted that should not have been out. March 2018. I was informed by a member of the DOD IG that Mr. Gary Reed was under a formal inspector general investigation for inappropriate relations with redacted and an additional accusation of possible sexual harassment against one of my former subordinates redacted. Later that year, I was interviewed by two representatives from DOD IG regarding the conduct of Mr. Gary Reed. I explained that I did not trust Mr. Gary Reed based upon personal observations while employed as a DOD civilian. I also indicated that there was a strong likelihood of Mr. Gary Reed seeking retribution against me for leaving the department in the manner I did, results available within controlled DODIG channels. I was assured by DODIG personnel that this threat was unconscionable. 2019, under a Freedom of Information Act request by a member of the media, it was revealed that an official U.S. AFOSI investigation was conducted regarding three unclassified videos that were authorized for release. In this investigation, there were no findings of me conducting any kind of unauthorized disclosure. Note, I was contacted on April 21st, 2021 by Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency Special Agent Redacted, advising I was required to submit a new interview for my security clearance, even though it was just ad adjudicated, approved in January 2021. I engaged with Redacted twice. April 26, 2021, and April 27, 2021 in this new interview. 
One of the inaccurate allegations redacted stated was that three videos were released inappropriately by me. She was unaware of the previous AFOSI investigation that concluded no wrongdoing on my part related to this specific matter. In my opinion, also untrue. Why? The actual evidence. If you look at it, it didn't say that he didn't do any wrongdoing. It clearly, if you read the redactions between the lines, I mean, it's no secret he filed the DD Form 1910. It's no secret that he didn't want them to be distributed to the media, but rather he wanted them for internal use only. But a reminder, the guy who reviewed the information stated he would not have approved the videos for release to the media. So if this was done properly and they were properly described of what the, they would be used for, they wouldn't have gotten the approval. So that doesn't equate to you didn't do anything wrong. That just means that it wasn't framed correctly. So mistakes were made. Additionally, I think we can safely say that's Elizondo, never received confirmations the videos were declassified. So what's going on here? And, and that's what I want to know is why are we making certain claims that just aren't backed up? This breaks down more of that AFOSI investigation to prove my point. It was not about wrongdoing by Luis Elizondo, but rather it was about, and look at the subject, Air Force Office of Special Investigation, Detachment 334, case, a long number, December 2017, unauthorized disclosure of potentially classified DOD videos. This wasn't an investigation into Elizondo himself, but rather an investigation on whether or not classified videos were currently being disseminated. Sit tight, because I think you'll see the differentiation between this investigation and another one, which clearly upset Elizondo, but I think, in my personal opinion, is actually warranted and makes sense. You can see here that number six that was checked attached is forwarded for action. This is key. The AFOSI report, which again outlined, I didn't go through it word for word. I invite you to do so, but I highlighted the key parts that this wasn't just for information purposes, meaning Elizondo was cleared. You don't have to do anything. Here's the inf information. There you go. Rather, they said, here you go, DOD or OSD. This is our investigation submitted to you for action. Jumping down here to this section of the investigation, the request for release, there was no indication the videos would be released to any news media outlet. The reason for publication was listed as not applicable, not for publication, research and analysis only, and info sharing with other U.S government and industry partners for the purposes of developing a database to help identify, analyze, and ultimately defeat UAS threats. Blank stated he would not have approved the video for release to the media. Additionally, Blank never received confirmation the videos were declassified. I know I already read that to you, but it's important to read again because this, I believe, plays into the action that they submitted in April of 2018, on the 21st to be exact. Now look at this. As of May of 2021, according to Elizondo, I am now under increased scrutiny regarding my security clearance. The investigative body is the Defense Counterintelligence Security Agency, or DCSA. Despite a previous favorable AFOSI investigation, I am under accusation of releasing the videos in an unauthorized manner. In addition, other false allegations have been made against me, including statements I never made on the History Channel television show Unidentified Inside America's UFO Investigation. It should be noted that the DCSA falls directly under the cognizance of Mr. Gary Reed. At one point during my conversation with the investigator, redacted, the discussion involved my role in ATIP. As I explained my former leadership role, redacted interrupted me and stated, no one is arguing the fact you ran ATIP. This issue is regarding the videos. I was shocked and surprised to hear this, given the current public stance of Ms. Goff. If the investigators at DCSA are aware of my role in ATIP, why is the Pentagon taking a different stance publicly? Furthermore, why am I able, excuse me, furthermore, why am I being reinvestigated over an issue after already being exonerated? Here's the problem. Also, I believe in my opinion, untrue. Let's dissect it. 
This was submitted for action. They're now looking at Mr. Elizondo. Why? The action is based on the fact that Mr. Elizondo stated one thing on the form, never received confirmation that the videos were declassified, and it was clear that the OCA said, nope, if I knew that they were going to be winding up in the media, I would not have done it would not have approved them for public release. So of course, naturally, that action is going to be okay. At least AFOSI determined that the videos were unclassified, which was the end of their report. So when it came to the video subject of the investigation, and that portion, it was determined that classified information was not floating around. But that did not mean that there was not mishandling of that information, potentially, by Mr. Elizondo, who was tied to the whole story. Hence the action by DCSA. They now look into the person behind all of it. But does it make sense that it would take this long to do an investigation? Well, keep in mind, AFOSI stopped in 2018. Luis Elizondo was already out of government at that point. So why in 2021 did all of a sudden he start getting this scrutiny? We can only speculate at this point, but it is quite possible that everything that I just outlined plays into why they started to do it. And maybe another part of this is that he was going to start utilizing his security clearance again. So DCSA decides based on this previous report investigation by AFOSI, there was no need to do it in 2018 because Luis Elizondo was still with TTSA, didn't need a security clearance. But now let's say with all these rumors that Luis Elizondo's consulting for Space Force or Space Command, whatever it might be, now all of a sudden, maybe when he did start getting this extra scrutiny, he needed his clearance again. He needed that to utilize that security clearance that although was sitting there, now it's being utilized. So quite possibly they look back and say, hey, we had this pending 2018 action. Now that he's going back to work as a contractor, we need to pursue it. Of course, I will make sure you guys know that there's speculation in there, but it does make sense based on the evidence that that's put forth that they would look into this. I don't know what exactly he's referring to about the statements made in unidentified. I, I, I have a guess, but I, I don't want to speculate too much there. So I'm not entirely sure without seeing any paperwork from DCSA. So I'm just going by what I see here. And if he's saying that he's being reinvestigated, that is untrue. AFOSI was looking at the videos. DCSA was looking at the person. This was submitted for action based on this. This all makes sense. So this narrative, I believe, is wrong. Um, the second part of this interrupted me in stating no one is arguing the fact that you ran a tip. This issue is regarding the videos. Yet again, crafting a narrative that isn't true. He's trying to play off of this stating, aha, well, nobody's questioning it. Ergo, it's true and you believe it. So why is Susan Goff stating otherwise? But to an investigator, it doesn't matter if he ran a tip or not. Like none of that was part of the scope of the investigation, not part of the stated scope of AFOSI's investigation and not part of the implied scope that Mr. Elizondo describes the DCSA investigation, but rather the fact that they go, look, we're not investigating whether or not you ran a tip. Essentially, they wouldn't care that that's irrelevant to the investigation. What is relevant is the handling of classified information. So a lot of people come after me going, ah, you're playing semantics. This is a clear indicator of semantics and twisting what is what is said to benefit you. And, and yes, I do believe that because you have to look at all of this in its totality because the evidence goes against the crafted narrative. That's what we have to do. Hone in on just that. It makes it look like Elizondo is a target. Look at the totality of the evidence tells you a different story. I often say documents don't lie, even though there can be lies on them. This is what I mean by it. You look at something and what people say, but then when you take all of the evidence and then look at it, it could potentially tell you a different story. And that's what I mean by all of this. 
Let me give you Mr. Elizondo's own words here in, a, in, an, in an important part of my interview with him, and I'll let you determine on whether or not any of this is truly how you feel it played out. According to the DOD anyway, those videos had to adhere to what was on that, what they call the DD Form 1910, which we didn't label it yet, but the DD Form 1910 was for that private US government use only. And when Christopher Mellon had come out recently, he had said that he supplied the, those videos to the New York Times. Then in the James Fox's great documentary, in that Christopher Mellon came out and said somebody didn't name them, but somebody bent the rules. That was uh, what his uh, wording was, which I want to juxtapose that with how we were shown the videos from To The Stars Academy. I don't expect you to speak for To The Stars. I'm not asking you to, but I do want to ask about what they called the chain of custody, because that's another one of those disconnects where paperwork says internal use only cleared for that. Then we see the videos and it they were kind of advertised at well not kind of they were advertised as going through the declassification process through dod is that accurate yeah, so what, what is that chain so, of custody you know I, I can't speak for chris mellon and quite frankly i've never asked chris i don't want to know uh, you know there's <laughs> i hate to say plausible deniability is sometimes a good thing uh, but out of respect for chris I, I i've never asked him this source and i don't really plan to to be honest with you that's between chris and and whoever he talked to um you know the, the how ttsa wound up putting them forward um i will tell you if you were to ask me you know i i probably would have been more hesitant to do that but you know it happened um and it happened without me knowing <laughs> um that really was so you had my, no idea that they goal. that they were going to release those videos uh, not until the, uh, New York times article. Yeah. Uh, that was not, um, I, I was not, aware, I was not aware. Um, yeah. So. Were you aware they had them? If I can ask that. No, actually. Um, uh, let me think. John, I, I don't recall. I, I really don't. I don't think because I remember being very surprised uh, because the intent originally was for a community of interest and unclassified, but for official use only, if you will, community of interest. Uh, and I, I didn't I wasn't the one who who provided them. So I really don't know what TTSA was thinking. You probably want to talk to them. As you know, I'm no longer um, uh, publicly affiliated with with TTSA they're they're great people uh, Tom's a great guy you know we, we yeah. still talk uh but um I I can't speak for TTSA I got you no I and I understand that um, and respect that so that is my interview with him and he had no idea according to him couldn't couldn't think that he found out kind of with the rest of us remember he's the one that filed the paperwork internally and he doesn't know who Christopher Mellon's source is. So let's operate off the assumption that that is correct and that he had no idea. And he didn't even want to want to ask Chris for plausible deniability reasons. Yet this photograph here came from what is kind of known in this conversation as the Chris Mellon leak. And I don't like leaks, but it's important here because number one, it's not classified and we know exactly what it is now. Uh, and I'll show you Chris Mellon's own words. But on top of that, it gives a very important piece of the puzzle that goes against the context and claim made in the IG complaint that I've been reading you guys, and also the clip that I just showed you of what Mr. Elizondo told to me. These were DVDs or CDs, I think DVDs, of the videos. There's four, I know there's three videos, a lot of question marks there. Um, I would actually venture to guess that the DD form 1910 is potentially on the fourth disc. Why would they spread them over four discs and not just put them on one is likely this is a guess and a little speculation, but I think that it's, it's um, um, potentially an educated guess that each medium, each file could potentially be classified different. So you're not going to put an unclassified, a secret and a top secret file generally 
on the same disc when being released out into the public. This is, is potentially they burned one at a time, ensuring that each particular media on each particular disc was unclassified. Okay. Um, the fourth, so one, two, three would be the videos Four potentially is that paperwork to go along with it that they said in the very beginning was that chain of custody that no one was able to show. So then that chain of custody turned into the DD form 1910 as talked about on coast to coast, then that turned into wait, I never wanted this to be out in the open. And I have no idea how it got out in the open. Yet the Chris Mellon leak shows us exactly how it got out into the open. This was the envelope that was given to Luis Elizondo. Um, I haven't seen who R Essex is likely somebody internally that works for you know, a department in the DOD that makes, whether it be an IT department, I don't know. Um, again, lots of, of guesses here, again, irrelevant, but rather this is the person burned these discs for Luis Elizondo. What's interesting here though, is the date, Christopher Mellon, uh, 1600 hours, so that's four o'clock on the 7th of September, 2017. The DD form 1910 was stamped only about a week or so, a uh, week and a half or so prior to this for the internal use. So only in about 10 days did these discs get sent to Luis Elizondo after he got approved for that internal release. And again, I'm punching this point because it's important, only internal use as intended by Luis Elizondo. It only took about 10 days for him to lose that data. Regardless of it being listed as unclassified, that does not mean you can give it to anybody. There is things called controlled unclassified information, but there's also unclassified information that's exempt from disclosure. All different things, and he is not a release authority. So it took within 10 or so days to lose this information, to wind up in the hands of somebody who wanted to leak it to Christopher Mellon. They did so on the 7th of September of 2017. And here in Christopher Mellon's own words is that story. I knew this was breaking news for the front page of the New York Times. Former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon managed to obtain the tapes from the Pentagon and chose the New York Times to break the story. I received the videos, the now famous videos, in the Pentagon parking lot from a Defense Department official. I still have the originals in the packaging. This is a case where somebody bent the rules a little bit and they did so uh, for the larger good and we're absolutely all better off because of it. Credit to James Fox and his excellent documentary, The Phenomenon, for that clip. Uh, obviously, all copyrights given to him. Uh, but I wanted to show that clip because clearly rules were bent. This came out from a Department of Defense official. He still has the wrapping. So clearly what we are looking at is the the UFO videos that he took a picture of and put it on his web server. I didn't tell this part of the story, but in short, that leak was not necessarily a hack or anything bad. Uh, Mr. Mellon had put all of this data on his web server and it was uh, at this um, uh, public web server that somebody stumbled on it. I believe they refer to him as Twitter user J, still around, I believe, in, in, in kind of UFO Twitter, uh, but stumbled upon it, released it, kind of the rest was history. So now we kind of put all this together. Do we really believe that Mr. Elizondo had zero idea? And again, if we do, which is fine, I'm not here to say the man is lying, but if we do, then that means within 10 days, he was careless with the information. It got out into the open. Rules were bent, which ended up in Christopher Mellon's hands. He later admitted in that documentary that he was the source for the New York Times. So it went to the media and boom, media frenzy ensued. Why wouldn't you look into that? Why would Mr. Elizondo challenge that? If he didn't know, then he lost the material. That, that envelope had his name on it. It was delivered to him. So he lost it. If we believe him to his word, and that's fine, then he lost it and was careless with the information. AFOSI says, look, we determined the videos are unclassified, but the way they got out 
is kind of suspect. So we're going to pass this back for action. DOD looks at it, says, yep, let's start questioning Mr. Elizondo and the potential, the possibility of the mishandling of information. None of that sticks out to me as a targeted effort. I don't care if Gary Reed, the scummiest of scumbags of the DOD that we all want to hate, had any role in it. All of that makes sense. The fact that they wouldn't do it would be more concerning than the fact that they did. Here's an extra tidbit of information for you. Remember that day that was passed off? That September 7th, 2017 date? You know what else happened that day? This document, also part of the leak, was the interview, the interview of Alex Dietrich. And this was done at the Sky Dome Restaurant, Doubletree Hotel, Arlington, Virginia. Um, I believe, and this is just speculation, this spelling error we should look at. There is somebody involved in this conversation, God bless him, who pretty much misspells a lot of words. Sorry, Mr. Elizondo, but you do that quite often. So did he type this? Not sure. But that is something to look at because this, if typed by him, if he was there or had any role in this or whatever, this could have been the handoff or part of the handoff and that uh, that happened on the same day that they were doing this. Also around this time, you can see Luis Elizondo reached out to Alex Dietrich at the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, this was August, so just a week prior, Alex Dietrich was sending copies of her logbook. This came out through the FOIA to Luis Elizondo. Why? Likely setting up this meeting here. Again, a lot of that is speculation, but it all kind of makes sense that that's when either the pass off happened and Mr. Elizondo did it. But again, I'll let you guys decide, but evidence sure speaks volumes with those documents. So I want to go back to this slide here and finish up this page before we got uh, into a little bit of a sidebar there. This is back to 2019. Several internet bloggers were notified by the new public affairs officer, Mr. Sherwood, that I had no duties regarding ATIP and that ATIP did not involve the study of UAPs. As a result, the bloggers began to disseminate reporting, accusing me of being a fabricator. At this point, I initiated a telephone call with Mr. Sherwood directly, directly in which he indicated that he was not happy with the way this was being handled internally within the department, and that he was aware I ran a tip, but forces within the building were telling him not to admit it. He also indicated that he is trying to write a new statement because the Navy substantiated my claims of working with a tip and redacted had called him personally to express his disappointment about the false claims by the department. Without 2020, without any resolution, a new public affairs office was assigned to respond to media inquiries regarding ATIP. Miss Susan Goff. Miss Goff is also a U.S. Army reservist in psychological operations. During Miss Goff's tenure, the, the public affairs officer statements became increasingly inaccurate and continued to change on a daily basis. As a result of the blatantly inaccurate and repeated false statements by Miss Goff, I wrote an email directly to her on June 3, 2020, where I addressed the specific issues and provided ample sources in which she could verify my position. Despite several attempts to correct the record, Ms. Goff never responded to my email, refused to address the issue, and has continuously provided false statements to the press, even as recently as this week. 2020. Well, let me stop there. So let me go back before I get too far ahead. Several internet bloggers were notified by the new public affairs officer, Mr. Sherwood. That paragraph there in 2019, fast forward in it where he says that he was, uh, quote, not happy with the way this was being handled internally within the department. Here's the problem with that. I heard that story before. So basically, you know, he had... PAOs have like a stack of previously approved statements. Yeah. They look through their stack. They have no comment that's been crafted. So they got to go out and reach out to the right people to get the right information to craft a statement. He was talking to me how he was with communicating with OUSDI, OUSDI back and forth, trying to craft something. And I got semi frustrated. <laughs> and I think he got semi frustrated because 
I was just like, come on, man. Like, what is going on over there? Like, this should be a slam dunk question. He did or he didn't. Yeah. And he sighed. I'll never forget this. He sighed and said, you know what? I'm not really happy with the way they're handling this story. And I was like, wow, what is going on behind the scenes here? <laughs> Almost verbatim from Stephen Greenstreet when I did an interview with him. He's the New York uh, Post journalist. Uh, hosts the the basement office on the New York Post YouTube channel and has joined me on this channel a couple times himself. My interview where he recollected that story was on June 23rd, 2021. And he said that Sherwood told him that. I confirmed with Stephen Greenstreet that he first told Elizondo that story on April 20th, 2021. And that exact quote then ended up in the DOD IG complaint that Elizondo submitted on May 3rd. May 2019, uh, I was doing the, my show for the New York Post basement office and just nonchalantly reached out to the Pentagon for a boilerplate statement on ATIP because I just wanted my own statement. And in there, they said that you had nothing. No, they said you had no responsibilities with ATIP. And then I followed up with um, the spokesman at the at the time, Chris Sherwood, what do you mean he had nothing to do with ATIP? Uh, Chris said to me on the phone, I'm not really happy with the way they're handling the story. They internally at the Pentagon. He was frustrated with that statement. Chris goes away. Sue Go Goff comes in there and, and she issues a new statement saying Lou had no assigned responsibilities with regards to ATIP. Right. <laughs> Yeah. What's the, why would the Pentagon consistently be saying this? Well, because my assigned duties were were through the read-on document from 2009 that substantiates what I was doing. And, and of course, thankfully, Senator Harry Reid has set that record straight many times for the record uh, of what my role was. And my name is clearly on that documentation and all the documentation. This is This goes back to what I told you. There's some people in the Pentagon that still don't like me very much. And unfortunately, uh, Colonel Goff, um, by the way, uh, interesting background of her own, uh, was not being well served. Um, she was getting information from, from people there that uh, were formerly in my chain of command that really did not like me coming out. Is it possible that Sherwood gave Elizondo the exact same quote? Absolutely. The problem was this was 2019. You would think that if a public affairs officer is doing two things, one, saying that he is not happy with the way that the situation is being handled, but also two, I know, and let me, let me quote, that Sherwood, the, the public affairs officer, was aware that Elizondo ran ATIP, but forces within the building were telling him not to admit it. If Elizondo heard that in 2019, why isn't this anywhere that I've seen anyway? And please correct me if I'm wrong. I am happy to update this. Where has Elizondo said that in any interview that he has done in the thousands of podcasts and interviews? You would think that that would lead the charge on stating, hey, I don't, you don't have to take my word for it. I have my story. I'm sticking to it. But you don't have to take my word. This is what the public affairs officer told me. And yet... That's nowhere to be found that I've seen. And it wasn't until Stephen Greenstreet told Elizondo the story that all of a sudden Elizondo goes, oh, I'll put that into my complaint like Sherwood told him. So did he? I don't have the answer to that. But is it strange that the exact same story now that Elizondo is putting in his IG complaint was already told publicly by a journalist almost verbatim? And that's the issue here is that there's so many kind of weird things. Now, if Elizondo wants to come out and say, yes, he told me that in addition to him telling Stephen Greenstreet and he told us all in the exact same way, cool, we can, we can have that conversation. But I think that my first question to that, and I hope others would ask him as well, is why did you not tell anybody this story? And that's what I don't understand about this. And it kind of makes you scratch your head and go, oh, did he just falsely attribute this story to himself in order to make the IG complaint look better. I don't have the answer to that, but sadly, there's not a whole lot forthcoming. So that's why I reached out to Stephen Greenstreet and confirmed the dates 
Um, I will let Stephen Greenstreet talk about his own opinion. I will not convey, nor do I speak for him or anybody else, uh, but rather wanted to confirm the dates. That's when he told Elizondo. That's when it ended up in Elizondo's complaint, then attributed to Elizondo. And nobody can, can confirm if Sherwood actually did tell Elizondo that story. And to be honest with you, that's... Um, I would say intriguing to say the least, because I want to know if that story shifted or not. Moving on, in January of this year, a FOIA response by the Pentagon confirmed the fact that Ms. Goff has sidestepped Pentagon protocol and inserted herself into the official FOIA processes that have been established to protect the American people and the integrity of information being provided to them. FOIA requests and responses are to be submitted to trained and designated FOIA personnel and not a public affairs office or officer. The fact that Ms. Goff has inserted herself into this process preemptively further emphasizes that the FOIA process enacted in U.S. law is being subverted. This ties into emails, which I'll show you in a little bit when we get to the attachments, but essentially what the line is being drawn here is is that Susan Goff is essentially injecting herself into the FOIA process and controlling the narrative of what is being released. I can tell you that the emails that I'll show you in a little bit, in my personal opinion, are being overblown to a point. It makes sense that a public affairs officer wants to maintain some kind of knowledge about what's being out there because if they're blind about what people like me are getting legally, then what happens is, is that when they make a statement that albeit may not be untrue, but it, if it differs enough or uses different verbiage or different language or different uh, context, uh, but, uh, but again, maybe not necessarily a lie, but it just kind of differs a little bit, then the internet just takes over. The rumor mill starts, the tabloids take over, sensationalism takes over, horrible reporting takes over. And so I think that to a point, that's understandable. And, and as I go through this in this presentation, I can see the negative feedback. John's just taking the side of the government. It's not that. But we have to understand the process. We have to re remove ourselves from the interest and passion that we have in this, myself included, and look at it from the outside in and go, okay, should the public affairs people be in the know about what is being released so they can properly address certain questions and make sure that there is some uniformity there? My answer would be yes. Some may say John's defending Susan Goff or Gary Reed or whomever. No, it's not about the person or the people. I'm not defending that, but rather I'm defending the situation, defending their job and what they do or what they're supposed to do, and defending the evidence that we have. That in a lot of cases, and in even most cases, actually differs from these paraphrased versions of the story. A lot of people took this complaint and said, Gary Reed, bad. Susan Goff, bad. Neil Tipton, bad. So they're bad. Lou Elizondo, good. Telling the truth. This proves it. Not really, because again, when you look at it from the outside in, look at what should be done, look at what's logical, what, look at what's common sense, and over all else, look at the evidence. It's, a, it's sometimes a different story, not in every case, but sometimes, and in, in this particular uh, document, I'm sorry, there are a lot of cases where when you look at the evidence and you look at other context and testimony, it contradicts. So I want to make that point and I want to make it strongly because I can see the feedback, the negative, the haters coming out saying John's just defending the government. Um, and that's not true because this is not about the people. This isn't about Lou Elizondo as a person, Susan Goff as a person, or Gary Reed as a person, even though he could be a really bad dude. It's not about that in this conversation, but rather it's not what you believe it's what you can prove. And in this matter and beyond in this complaint, you have to match up the evidence. And in this case, and again beyond, it just isn't there. And we have to make that point. Let's move on.
May 2021, I was recently informed by a member of the media who is conducting a formal Freedom of Information Act request that upon clarifying my roles in ATIP, DOD Public Affairs Office Ms. Goff indicated in writing that all my records have been destroyed due to lack of historical significance and could not be reproduced. I was informed that DOD took this action in 2019, despite portions of my work involving legal discovery and evidence as it relates to the upcoming Military Commission's trial, Guantanamo Bay, in essence, destroying evidence. If this is true and my records were indeed destroyed, I'm unclear how Ms. Goff can man maintain I had no assigned duties when in fact no records exist. I remain duly concerned that this statement is not only false, but maliciously deceitful and intended to mislead the American people. As of today, the Pentagon Public Affairs Officer, Ms. Goff, continues to assert to the media that I had no involvement in the Pentagon program. Fortunately, the original ATIP sponsor has provided official documentation contradicting this obvious attempt to deceive the public. This is what he's referring to, the Harry Reid letter. I can tell you the Pentagon already addressed this. They said it does not change anything. You couple that with, again, Harry Reid's interviews. He was never briefed on OSAP or ATIP. What does he know? I mean, like, there's a lot of questions there. So the fact that this letter exists does not prove much. But let me back up to all of this here. This, yet again, my opinion, untrue. Why? Because I am the guy that actually broke this story. So I've got a personal connection to this paragraph here. I researched it for months. There was absolutely no involvement by Susan Goff. None. I never reported that. I tried to get her to comment on it, but none of this is true as attributed to Susan Goff. In addition, the story was not about all of his files. The story was about his emails. There's a huge difference. Now, even though I truly believe the DOD messed up and I truly believe that's a huge story and I truly believe it's important, the problem here is this is completely misconstrued, not only putting an accusation on the wrong person, but on top of that, embellishing the story to make it seem like every file that Luis Elizondo ever made is gone, including all the ones in Guantanamo Bay or, or, or regarding Guantanamo Bay. None of that was ever reported. None of that was ever claimed. None of that ever was ever told to me. And Susan Goff did not play a role in it. In fact, here is the breakdown of it. In December of 2019, specifically my case 19F1903, when I asked for certain records, emails from Luis Elizondo, I was told there was no records. This specific request, I believe, was for a keyword search on the word unidentified. So essentially, we should have something. That really clued me in that something was wrong, um, that I knew something here was amiss. I appealed and I won. Fast forward to April 2021. Not only did they reinforce there were no records, but they said, please note that emails of former Department of Defense employees are not retained unless they are considered historical records and retained by the National Records Center. There are currently no existing email accounts for Mr. Elizondo. We believe that search methods were appropriate and could reasonably be expected to produce the requested records if they existed. Throughout multiple uh, attempts, and I mean through months of trying to figure this out, I was told that, again, his emails were destroyed with further clarification, stating if the user left OSD in 2017, but is still working in the DOD, meaning they are still using their at mail.mil email, that there's a chance those emails still exist. If they left the DOD entirely in 2017 and haven't used it, uh, used their mail.mil email since they since then, they emails would be gone unless the user was journaled. A journaled account is an optional DOD enterprise email service that provides mission partners the ability to retain all messages and their attachments sent to and from selected journaled mailboxes. While not required for all end users, it is recommended for high ranking and other designated individuals whose email may contain official records which are subject to legal and regulatory requirements. Messages and journaled accounts are preserved for 10 years. All that, right, took months to get on top of years of the FOIA. Each and every single time I communicated with the Department of Defense, 
It was not signed by Susan Goff. Susan Goff had nothing to do with this legal process that I worked incredibly hard over. My whole point here is that we have created various narratives about people that aren't necessarily true. And when you look at the just the claim, it, it really does resonate with a lot of people. I've seen the reactions to this complaint. You go, wow, Gary Reed's out to get him. Susan Goff's evil. She's out to get him. I'm not here to defend any of them. All I'm here is to show you that if you look at all the pieces of the puzzle, if you look at all the pieces of the evidence, if you look at the totality of the story, it is something different. We cannot get away with that. Ignore my personal opinion or your personal thoughts about me. If you hate me, but you're stuck and glued watching this, take all that out of the equation and just look at the stories, look at the evidence and look at what is being said and how it cannot be backed up. This is important. This is the time to nitpick. People hate when I do it, but we are accusing people inside the Pentagon of some pretty serious stuff and stuff that connects to a topic that's pretty serious for a lot of us. Some of it may be personal curiosity. Some of it may be for national security concerns. Some of it fill in the blank. It doesn't matter, but it's an important topic. So we should nitpick. We should look at these claims and understand when the evidence is not there to back it up, we shouldn't try and make the claim. Yet we've gone so far now that the DODIG is looking at these stories. What are they going to do? What are they going to think? And that's why I'm always concerned when people are putting so much into the fact that Mr. Elizondo is claiming his complaint did something when we don't even know if the DODIG took any of this seriously. Maybe they did, but the evidence just really isn't strong to support the strongest accusations in the complaint. Moving on, please note additional information substantiating the above can be provided. It is my sincere concern that I'm being unfairly targeted along with other others formerly associated with ATIP for retribution and may even fall under whistleblower protection. There exists a severe conflict of interest and I am being persecuted by having my reputation and credibility constantly challenged and attacked by elements within the Pentagon. The result has impacted me professionally, financially, and personally. Furthermore, the hardship endured by my family has cost us unimaginable pain and suffering. As a final thought, the U.S. government is enjoined and must remain committed to serving the interest of the public. This includes being truthful and transparent in all interfaces. I am certain it would be a surprise to many that Ms. Goff has already publicly stated her position regarding this interface. Equally fallacious in today's world of instant worldwide communication is the notion that you can separate military psychological activities from public affairs and public diplomacy. Page 36, The Evolution of Strategic Influence by Lieutenant Colonel Susan L. Goff, U.S. Army. I sincerely hope that my government does not believe that psychological manipulation of the public is in the best interest of our government and our country. Yes, that's a real quote from uh, a paper that Susan Goff wrought, uh, wrote and something that you can find on the Black Vault as well. I'll put all those links and, and stuff in the in the show notes so you have all sorts of stuff to read. But that is that is real. That That's something she said. But yet again, at this point, we have a couple elements of, of being drilled that Susan Goff is the bad, the bad guy. And, and again, I'm, I'm, this may come off to some as that I'm defending her, and it's not about that. But rather, look at what we've looked at at the complaint thus far, because this is the end prior to the attachments. That Susan Goff is named, but not Christopher Sherwood. Sherwood was the one, the one that made that original shot across the bow comment. Susan Goff essentially softened it. If there's additional information that I'm not aware of that Goff was involved before she was ever attributed anything, then let's see that. But until then, that's seemingly um, a misdirected accusation because it wasn't her that made that statement, but rather it was someone else who has no accusation made against him in this claim. What is made uh, here is that again, Susan Goff was the one that made it. But then when you start looking at more of the information, it seems like she has worked to support that. 
but it's still the word of the DOD, not Susan Goff. So why is she targeted here when then there's another part of what's thrown her direction as completely fabricated accusations that ties into my story? So again, that, that, that's why I get a little bit um, passionate about this section of it, because again, it's not about defending anybody, but my own reporting that he's utilizing to craft a narrative that isn't right. It's not, it's not real. It's not anything anybody ever said. And, and it was being put on somebody who didn't even play a role in the story. So it is so frustrating to see that because again, when you look at it on the surface, it's believable. Look at the evidence. It is a completely different story. Going through some of the attachments here, and there's quite a few of them, but we can go through these. This uh, was the Harry Reid letter, uh, which were quite a few pages. I'm just going to kind of flip through here. I've done a whole video breakdown, uh, but this obviously was Harry Reid's letter that you can read in full. That was one of the attachments. Also attached were Luis Elizondo's uh, performance evaluations. So you'll see here that, uh, again, I invite you to read the the documents in full. I'm not going to go over every single line because we're already quite a bit into this. Um, but what I think really sticks out is there's no mention of a tip. There's no mention of anything that he was doing as that parallel portfolio. What is in here were his duties that in multiple times in the complaint were essentially uh, alluded to by him stating that these supervisors who learned about his parallel portfolio or the ATIP effort was just don't let it affect your normal job. So in other words, this does support that this was just a side effort that doesn't negate the result. If there were any, the problem is, is that completely goes against what we were told for years. And it completely reinforces that people like me that had every right to question the story in the end, it looks like it was a legitimate question to ask. I want to note because I'm not trying to, to, to just skip this. He was getting excellent reviews. And I want to point that out because I'm not, I'm not skipping over this to try and hide that. Uh, but rather there's just a lot of information to cover. Um, so read it, but, but I, I want to point out he was getting excellent reviews. There was nothing that was bad or said uh, against him uh, in these reviews. So you'll be able to go through all of this. Uh, also in there were the DD form 1910s, which we've already gone over. Also those emails that were back and forth. In my opinion, the emails do not support the claims that were made in the complaint. I invite you also to read them more in depth. There was never any talk about a unlimited distribution to the general public. So all of that is a complete contradiction to the evidence. Lots of different emails here. I do have a video breakdown of these from a couple years ago when I first got them. The New York Times article was repeated in full. Politico's first article in December of 2017 repeated in full. So we'll just obviously thumb through those. This is that Luis Elizondo, James Clapper, obviously backstage in a green room or something like that at CNN. Not really sure what Clapper's connection is. I mean, there's there's always rumors, but you know, if, Cla if Clapper knew and he was so proud of Luis Elizondo heading this program because he had direct knowledge, hey, I'd love to hear it. Uh, love to see it. The AFOSI investigation, we already went over that, but that was attached to, to this. Oddly, a off the record and confidential email from Tim McMillan. Uh, it was chopped off in what was posted online, uh, but you can see here it was a, essentially Tim was working on a story about their esteemed backgrounds. So obviously this was gonna be a very favorable piece on whatever he was uh, working, uh, you know, working towards. Um, another thing here was the email uh, that he wrote on June 3rd, 2020 to Susan Goff. So that is in there uh, as well. That came out through FOIA. What I want to point out, however, is what not was in what, what, what was not in the complaint. And what was not in the complaint was an email I also turned up in FOIA that talked about his description of a tip as an activity versus a program. My question mark 
is why wouldn't you include all the evidence unless you didn't want to negate what you were doing? When the first FOIA release went out, it was posted by Alejandro Rojas. This was not included. Now, I did verify, um, but I will let all of you ask Alejandro. I verified that what Alejandro posted was the totality of what he got. So I believe that he requested this specific email. I'll go back uh, to this slide. So this one came out through FOIA and then later republished here. Uh, so I think he specifically requested that one, likely because maybe Mr. Elizondo told him. Um, but what Mr. Elizondo didn't tell the IG, didn't tell uh, Alejandro Rojas or anybody else, was this second email that was sent in 2019, essentially giving a different perception of what ATIP really was, just an activity versus a program that was widely reported in 2017, 2018, and 2019. But clearly here, it was something different. These were the emails that were around. This was uh, obviously um, uh, highlighted in the complaint, uh, but I believe that it was highlighted online and Mr. Elizondo took that. This was showing that Susan Goff, let me see here. This was, this was essentially showing that Susan Goff was going to be in the loop on any FOIA requests and FOIA releases. Uh, generally speaking, we let the normal FOIA process work as it is supposed to, but we have been requesting the FOIA offices coordinate with us on UAP focused FOIA responses before they hit reply so that new terms, language, language, etc., aren't introduced that complicate the overall messaging. Um, at the top here is where the Susan Goff mention is. Megan is correct from a public affairs perspective. All media inquiries on a UAP go to public affairs, Susan Goff. I think that there was a bigger case made. I think that there was a, a bigger deal made about this than should have been. I know that this kind of reads that Susan Goff is like the ringleader and she's watching every FOIA that goes out. My guess is she's likely in the loop of the FOIA that goes out, but I've seen no evidence that she has been directly involved in being a release authority. The FOIA offices have their own internal release authorities on who reviews documents and, and, and essentially decides what is released to the general public. That is not a spokesperson's job. And so for them to make that accusation against Susan Goff, again, if there's evidence, I'd love to see it. Uh, this, however, just doesn't prove that to me. I, I mean, I, 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 I don't see it. And I think that it makes sense that they would want to see what goes out in the language of FOIA letters just to ensure that nothing is being said that shouldn't, that would make someone like me, make someone like the Daily Mail, the New York Post, whomever's writing a story, misconstrue something and create a narrative that isn't true. Because God knows we've got enough of that going on. Uh, here's some more emails that were used to kind of uh, essentially prove that that there was a lot of um, shenanigans going on on the release of information. Uh, this was written by Susan Goff. One other thing you need to do is reach out to the Air Force's FOIA office. We need to keep a very, very close eye on FOIA requests for release of UAP videos to ensure consistency of what does or doesn't get released. Generally so far, at least with Navy vids, we're not releasing them. This totally makes sense as well. I mean, we're, we're not, it, it, for me, this doesn't read that they're circumventing themselves, uh, they're circumventing the FOIA process and injecting themselves into the review, but rather they wanna make sure that whatever does come out, they're aware of it. So let's say they put out a statement and go, well, this is classified, we're not gonna talk about it, or it's not being released, or it is being released, but then another office says, wait a minute, we haven't made that decision. All that makes sense that there's going to be a coordinated effort because look what happens. A story comes out, it goes viral quick when it, it's about UAP. So you have to be able to um, look at those, those occurrences, those events that are happening through the legal channels, stay on top of it. Because if you're speaking for the agency, you're not going to do it blind. You're going to have to be informed about what the FOIA is releasing. So again, a lot of that makes sense. Uh, the FOIA release to Mark Sicotti for those emails was in there. The Harry Reid letter was also attached. 
One thing I want to point out about all these attachments is the date. All printed on the same day. Now, that may not seem too significant, but the Tim McMillan letter that I talked about, another uh, Susan Goff e email that I referenced, all from his Gmail account, the Politico story, the New York Times story, uh, another printout. When you sometimes print, they obviously date in the top corner when you print it, the date of print, 5-3-2021. Now, why is this relevant? Because you may just kind of skim right past it. I haven't seen a lot of people talk about that. It's the same date that the evaluation of the DOD's actions regarding the unidentified aerial phenomena uh, notice went out from the Department of Defense Office of the Inspector General, the same exact day. Now, some may think, aha, and they actually believe it, that it was Luis Elizondo's complaint that sparked this. It was not. And I believe this is proof of that. This was released on the same day that he printed all that material. So for the likelihood, the likelihood of him putting all that stuff together after he prints it out, uploads it to the DOD hotline, the DOD IG looks at it, reads 84 pages, whatever it is, goes through the whole thing, goes, aha, we need to do a evaluation. They all internally make that decision. They craft this memo. They send out the release all within like 12 hours. Not a chance. What happened here? And was this announcement, what sparked them, meaning Luis Elizondo and his attorney or attorneys or whomever was involved in this, to go, hey, just, just speculation, but maybe we can piggyback on this because I believe that I have heard that, that their IG complaint sparked this. I couldn't find an exact quote, so I'll let you guys decide all of that. There are 12 million interviews to go through, but I can tell you just from online chatter that a lot of people do believe whether it was said uh, directly or not, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter to me, but I'm here to dispel the myth. There's no possible way that that was submitted on the 3rd of May, 2021 to the DODIG, and they turned around a announcement to the general public that they looked at it, decided to have a um, evaluation done, and they were moving forward. So here are some closing thoughts. I know we just went through a big rundown, a huge deep dive into the IG complaint. I was apprehensive to do this video and this rundown because when I first read the complaint, certain things stuck out that we've already gone over and even some that I decided not to put in this presentation that I knew was wrong. Now, whether that's human error, whether that's malicious, whether that's just a misunderstanding or maybe we just don't have all of the story, it to me doesn't matter. I was apprehensive to do this because I just didn't want yet another video to have a seemingly attack against Mr. Luis Elizondo. I said recently in a radio show that I did that I really liked the man and like the man. I have no problem with him. From, from a personal standpoint, I felt we get along. I felt that we talked similar language. Uh, I'm not military, but rather have investigated a lot of stuff and can kind of talk that talk a little bit where I understand secrecy. I understand some of the stuff, the ins and outs of what he was talking about. And I felt a certain click and I felt a certain understanding about him. But in the same respect, I can't just let my personal feelings cloud what I've done for more than 25 years. And that is look at stories, look at claims, look at evidence, look at documents, seek out documents, seek out evidence, and apply it to this situation. I can't tell you how much heat I have gotten from people, including some vicious heat over the years. And it's not fun. It, I don't do this to be popular, clearly. It would behoove me to just essentially lay down and go, hey, he's telling the truth. And how dare all of you say anything but he is speaking gospel. That would get me more friends. That ha would have me uh, get a, a, a much easier time on social media. And I wouldn't have most of the quote unquote haters that will do tweet thread after tweet thread or meme after meme because that is their only contribution 
of attacking me on a personal level or on a, um, we'll leave it at vicious. There were people that doxed my business, my personal income, like my real job away from the black vault has nothing to do with it. Doxed that with posting an address, which thankfully I think far ahead, that's a public address. So it's not that big of a deal, but they thought that they were doxing that. I know for a fact that they were, were trying to create issues for my business online. I won't give details because don't want to give any more people ideas, but all of this was well talked about on social media. They put it out there on Twitter. So all of that would go away. I'm not trying to play a victim here, but rather putting into context why I'm saying what I'm saying. But if I just fell down and said, hey, this is all gospel, I'd be lying to you because it clearly isn't. The evidence doesn't match up to the claims. The testimony doesn't match up to the evidence. And as you can see here, the testimony doesn't even add up to the testimony. These are all important questions we need to ask. Some may have easy answers. I've said that a million times. But until we get the answers, we should continue to ask. But clearly we have discrepancies here and, and issues that are now being put into complaints and accusations being made about other people. And as I've proven, accusations being made that are unfounded. An accusation made against somebody that had nothing to do with the story. I spent probably the most time, I didn't time it, on that because that was personal to me. Not because of the people involved, but because accuracy means something to me. And when somebody uses my work and uses it to accuse somebody of something that they didn't do, that they had no role in, that they had no part in, then I'm going to say it. And that's what's frustrating about this because some people will equate that to, ah, John's just a government stooge. He's going ahead and defending X, Y, and Z. And he's, uh, he shouldn't be doing that. But in reality, it's about the truth, right? Isn't that what we all want? What I've been lambasted for, and <clears throat> so many other people, for asking certain questions about the videos, about the story, about ATIP, about the origin, about OSAP, the nickname, the this, the that. As if you look back, you can actually see what we were lambasted for years ago is actually widely accepted now. That even Christopher Mellon says, yes, rules were bent getting those videos out. A couple years back, I said that they weren't coming out through kosher means. And I was viciously attacked for that. Yet here we are where one of the main players involved goes, yeah, rules were bent. And everybody says, well, that's, that's no big deal. Well, wait a minute. It was a big deal when I said it. And yet we've changed. We've altered course. That worries me. The ends do not justify the means. If you build a story on a weak foundation, you build that house of cards on something weak, what happens? It's going to fall down. I've done a video on this channel about history repeating itself. That if you look at the mid and late 60s and the work of Gerald Ford and congressional interest in UFOs and the push for further, not only transparency, but inquiry into a potential national security threat, what happened? We got the Condon Report. And for decades, the U.S. government and U.S. military lied through their teeth based on that to all of us. As we sit right now, man, there's some awesome, promising things going on. But people thought that in 1967, 1968 as well. People thought, hey, this is it. Finally, for decades of, of investigating UFOs, they're taking it seriously. They're having that conversation. Scientists are looking at the data. And in the end, the house of cards fell. Will that happen now? I'm not trying to be a pessimist, but rather realistic. And going back to this complaint, in my opinion, and that's why I kept stressing opinion, this isn't going to help. Because as we can clearly see in many examples, the evidence just isn't there. But to the mainstream media or UFO Twitter or wherever, 
if you don't know the proper context or have the time to look at it, you may look at this on the surface and go, aha, gospel. They are unfairly targeting this man and they should be punished. But what if the evidence isn't there? What if things are wrongly attributed to someone else that shouldn't be? What if somebody's taking credit for hearing something they didn't necessarily hear? Is all of that just an acceptable mistruth? Is all of that ah, just okay? Because we have congressional hearings. I don't know the answer. I'm here for the ride and I'll keep bringing you these types of developments. But that said, I had to give you some of those closing thoughts because I just don't understand the lack of evidence and the ability to make accusations like this without evidence. And on top of that, have some of the people out there just believe it because he said it. We have to look at the evidence. And I hope that that's what I've done here in the last couple of hours to go through this and to show you guys. We need to ask those important questions, including why the root, the person who, although was brought up in the IG complaint, the person that started what I called that shot across the bow against Luis Elizondo, no accusation was made. Why not? That's a huge question for me. If there's evidence to show that Susan Goff at that time made Sherwood say it, okay, let's talk about that. I see no evidence of it. Am I hunting for it? Yes. If I find what I've just said is, is a wrong assumption, I will bring that to you. Not a problem. But as of right now, there is nothing to support it. Sherwood was the guy that led the charge by name against Luis Elizondo, and he's nowhere to be found as in the list of the accused. It does not matter if Susan Goff then carried that torch. If you are, are really accusing the DOD of creating these falsehoods against you, then name them all, not just the cherry picking. And that's what's frustrating about this and seeing this, that there are good guys and gals and bad guys and gals. And this story that has played out is pitting the good versus the bad. Gary Reed, Susan Goff, Neil Tipton, bad. By the way, what did you see that Neil Tipton did that was bad? We went through the whole thing. That's another one. Hey, maybe he did do something bad because he didn't run out and endorse Elizondo. Well, on paper... Sherwood did a lot more than Tipton. Tipton was just around. So I don't get that one, but probably more to the story. Until we get those pieces of the puzzle, we just have to try and fill in the blanks the best that we can. I'm always curious to your thoughts. If you're watching here on YouTube, please look below. See the comments already. Add your own. If you disagree with me, I'm glad. I don't expect all of you to agree with all of my points. Give me your feedback. Give me your reaction to some of this. If you learned something new, awesome. Put it down there. Let us know. If you're listening listening on the audio podcast version, thank you for doing that. You can uh, stream all of these types of presentations in audio podcast form if you're not aware by going to any podcast aggregator and looking for the Black Vault radio. A lot of these presentations get dropped there sometimes a few days after the presentation first airs on YouTube, but you can stream them there as well. If you do listen on the audio version, please, it's a big help to give a review. I shoot for five stars, but I would never tell you what to put, but please leave your comments and your review there because it is a big help. And same with YouTube, thumbs up, make sure you're subscribed, subscribe to the channel and turn those not notifications on. I'm always interested in your questions. I'm considering doing a live show, uh, not tonight because this was a, a big thing for all of you to digest, but maybe in the next week or so to take some calls, to take some of your questions and to kind of dive into stuff that maybe I missed or overlooked or maybe didn't explain clearly enough, which in a video that goes a couple hours is definitely easy to do. So uh, the comments on that, asking for that really does serve as motivation for me. Why? This video is proof of that. I was not going to do it until I saw the overwhelming reaction to me mentioning a maybe 
And then you guys kind of flooded me with DMs and public posts, and here we are. So thank you for that. Thank you for your support of this channel, and I'm really looking forward to seeing your feedback. And for now, this is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and I'll see you next time.